Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to the Cannabis Plant Science and Compliance Mini Conference, we're calling it. I'm Joanne Kadrevich. I am the chair of the Cultivation Committee for the Cannabis Association of New York, fondly known as CANI. Um, CANI is an industry association that represents the whole supply chain and the businesses that serve the industry. Just by a show of hands, I'm curious, how many people who are licensed in the industry are here today? All right, right on. So I, my other hat is I'm also CEO of Ravensview Genetics, which is a cannabis cultivation facility in Delhi. And so um, I joined Canny for all of the advocacy that they do and the education that they provide. Provide And as chair of the cultivation committee, we're starting to put out some content that we think um, serves everybody in the supply chain. So we want you to definitely hook in on our website and check everybody out. I'm also doing this in conjunction with the Western New York committee for Canny, who does a lot for this area. So keep an eye out for that as well. Um, I want to also mention that we are being sponsored by the CWI, the Cannabis Workforce Initiative, and you're going to hear from David Serrano and two presentations from the CWI. Um, and I'll share more about that when he comes up, but it's a collaboration. The CWI, Cannabis Workforce Initiative, is a collaboration between the Workforce Development Institute and Cornell University. And their mission is to provide education and um, workforce development within the cannabis industry. So David has a table also here and has a lot of information for those of you who may want to be hiring people at some point or may be looking for jobs. He's a great person to connect with. Just so everybody knows, oh, there he is. Just so everybody knows we are recording this and it is being live streamed. So we will be able to provide you with the recording afterwards if there's anything more that you wanna learn about or re-look re at. Of course, I also wanna mention where we are, Buffalo State University. Big cheers for B Buff U, um, Buff State U. We are being hosted by this amazing university. I've never been here before, but got an, a tour of the science department and it is truly inspirational. And so to kick us off today, I'm going to bring up the chair of the, the chemistry department, Dr. Bagley. Welcome. It's great to see everybody here today. Um, as she said, I'm representing the chemistry department, and um, I wanted to talk a little bit about a new program that chemistry department is trying to develop today in medicinal plant chemistry. Um, and so I'll just tell you a little bit about a couple of micro credentials that we have in the works um, for training um, people to work in the industry, sort of on the chemistry side of things. So, um, so we started thinking about medicinal plant chemistry about a year ago. Um, it was obvious that the increasing legality of medicinal plants has great, created a great demand and for technical personnel in both cannabis and herbal extract and natural products um, industries. And in particular, the legal cannabis programs, as we know in New York State, are expected to create lots and lots of jobs. So says the Department of Labor in New York State anyways. And I would advocate that some of those jobs are likely to require at least some chemistry background. And so we're sort of trying to develop a program that would help in that regard. So uh, for instance, according to the New York Department of Labor, there will be professionals that are needed in to fill a variety of positions and the positions that we feel that we could actually participate in would be processing professionals, which the Department of Labor says might require one to three years of education and experience in extraction and infusion techniques and train technicians to work in testing laboratories. Um, and they would be required to provide quality assurance testing for cannabis and cannabis products prior to their sale. And so with that in mind, the chemistry department has developed a series of four courses, which we we're going to bundle into two micro-credentials. Um, one will be um, providing hands-on training in extraction and infusion techniques, and the other one will be providing what somewhat more training in chemical analysis of cannabis-based products. So um, 
I'm just going to go over the two micro credentials that we're going to be um, off offering. Um, I'm sort of advertising for our department at this stage. Um, so there's one of the two micro credentials is called medicinal plant science, and it's a basic micro credential. I'd say it's a more basic micro credential for those interested in working in the production of plant-based products for medicinal and recreational purposes. So it's going to consist of two courses. These are two brand new courses that we've just developed. Um, one is medications. That's more of a sort of a basic pharmacology course that will talk a little bit more about the structure and mechanism of action for some common medications and natural products. Um, from the cannabis side, I would expect we would be talking a little bit about cannabinoid receptors and what the differences are in the structures of the various cannabinoids and what the terpenes look like and things like that. Um, <laughs> It will also talk about some regulations and the differences in regulations for those drugs that are um, regulated by the FDA versus herbal, uh, herbal products, which are regulated quite differently. And now, of course, cannabis in New York State is going to be regulated differently again, right? So um, we'll talk about a lot of different kinds of pharmacology, including various routes of administration, et cetera. And this is a lecture-based course. The other course is more of a lab-based course in medicinal plant chemistry. It will provide an overview of plants as sources of chemical compounds, talk about the natural, the various natural classes of natural products, um, their biosynthesis, their uses in medicine and flavorings, cosmetics and recreation. And in particular, this will have a lab and that will concentrate on extraction, identification, purification and analysis of different classes of phytochemical compounds. We anticipate that hemp will be make a presence in this particular um, course um, for extraction purposes. Um, it will also involve qualitative chemical analysis of isolated compounds and an overview in general of recreational plants, cannabis, hemp industry, and the various regulations. So we anticipate that this micro-credential would be open to students from chemistry backgrounds, biology backgrounds, other science-related backgrounds. Um, they will need to have completed some organic chemistry with some laboratory, but that is actually possible even with an associate's degree um, in natural sciences because a lot of the community colleges do require or can't, at least students can take up through two semesters of organic chemistry and then transfer or whatever. So this is something that we anticipate um, quite a lot of different people will be um, eligible to take. The other one, other micro-credential is a little bit more advanced, okay? It really is the chemical analysis of medicinal plants. Um, it's really for those interested in either utilizing um, chemical analysis, instrumentation, or developing even protocols for detecting and quantitating the various compounds that are isolated from medicinal and recreational plants. And this is again a two course sequence. Um, one of the courses is, is in analytical toxicology. Um, this is a course that we actually already teach for our forensic chemistry program. Um, it introduces um, toxicology that's relevant to pharmaceutical, forensic, and clinical analysis. It explores the main categories of inorganic and organic toxins. So we would anticipate being looking at heavy metals here, uh, various toxins that are present in plants, various toxins that may be present in microbes that infect plants um, and things of that nature. Um, it, there is a lab in this course, sample collection treatment, chromatographic separation techniques, spectroscopic and spec mass spec techniques for various compounds that are toxic. So this is toxicology. The other class is really cannabis analysis. This is the um, need of the program, perhaps as, um, as far as you guys are concerned. Um, this is going to overview the various instrumental analysis methods for chemical analysis of various target analytes um, in both cannabis and cannabis derived products. Um, it's going to have a laboratory component where students will use analytical instruments for separation, identification, quantification of chemicals for, for instance, potency tests and quality control for its products. Um, 
it's going to involve students learning about development and validation of analytical methods as well, which we see as being important as the regulations kick in in the industry. So this is, as I said, a more advanced um, sort of micro-credential. It does require some coursework in analytical and instrumental analysis. Um, of course, students who went through a chemistry degree of any kind would have had these kind of courses. Our own students, of course, have these courses. And so we're hoping that a number of our students who are in the bachelor's degree program right now will choose to do this um, particular micro-credential and perhaps people who are already out in the industry working as chemists who want to learn more about cannabis perhaps will decide to come back and hopefully do this micro-credential. So I just wanted to point out that you'll see as we go over to the new building for lunch in the science and math complex, we have a nearly new building. When we got that building, um, the state of New York provided quite a lot of money for scientific instrumentation. And so we are quite well prepared for the kinds of, of chemical analysis that are needed for these micro-credentials. We have separations, um, all kinds of separations technology, including several HPLCs, gas chromatography. We have two GCMSs. We have an LCMS. We have spectroscop spectroscopy, excuse me, um, several UV vis spect spectrometers. We have an FTNMR, 400 megahertz FTNMR. We have um, FTIRs and we have atomic absorption, which of course could be used for heavy metal analysis. Um, because we're a forensic chemistry program as well, we have a lot of microscopy, more microscopy I think than most chemistry departments would have. We have IR and Robin microscopy, which is really important in forensics and could be important in this field as well. We have a lot of different kinds of optical microscopy. And then other things we have in the program, we have DNA analysis, we have electrophoresis and gel documentation, our chemistry majors all take a course in biochemistry and a biochemical techniques course. We have PCR, and then we also have a Brooker X-ray crystallographic system and a scanning electron microscope in the basement yeah. of the building. So we feel like we're pretty well prepared to, um, to sort of train students in this um, particular area. And um, I should point out, this is not a chemistry thing, but we do have a brand new um, greenhouse on our science and math complex. You'll see it as you walk towards the science and math complex for lunch. It's right here at the end of the building. Um, it has both instructional and research bays. The research bays, you can, it's possible to, to um, control the environment individually in the different bays. So um, we're hoping that our, our um, biologists will, sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction, um, will we'll get involved perhaps in producing, getting the licenses required and producing some help for our use in, in our classrooms. And so that just want to end by saying this is who we are. Um, we are a faculty of nine. I'm um, Kim Bagley. I'm the chair of the department momentarily. Um, it will soon be Scott Goodman, who is sitting right here. Uh, we have a couple of physical chemists, um, Dr. Zeki Elsai, Mark Severson. Um, we have um, an inorganic chemist, Dr. Saurabh Biswas. We have um, organic chemistry and medicinal chemistry are represented quite well with Dr. Sewall and Dr. Goodman. And um, analytical chemistry is represented by um, Dr. Jin Hu, who's sitting here, and Dr. Jamie Kim. And I should say that I had very little to do with these medicinal, these micro credentials. It's really the two organic chemists who put together the coursework for the first of those micro credentials. And it's really our analytical chemists who put together the coursework for the second of the micro credentials. And so that's it. That's all I have to say. I do want to say welcome. I hope you have a chance to look around our facilities while you're having lunch. And I hope you enjoy the day. Well, thank you. That's a reminder also that when we have, when we do break for lunch after the morning presenters, we're gonna be going to another building, which is where you'll see there's a planetarium there. There's amazing, amazing stuff to see in that building. So I'm going to bring up our next presenter.
Let me see if I, great. Okay, there we are. So I'm gonna bring up David Serrano. David is the project manager for the Cannabis Workforce Initiative of which I spoke earlier. And he's going to share with you some information about um, cannabis plant science. And why is this? Huh. You wanna put, want put it? There you go, speed up. I know our person went away to buy a better. Okay, give me one second. Try to go away. So while she's doing that, I'll just talk a little bit about the Cannabis Workforce Initiative. Um, my name is Dave Toronto. Uh, as I mentioned, product manager of the Cannabis Workforce Initiative. We are a collaboration uh, between the Workforce Development Institute of New York and Cornell University School of Industrial Labor and Relations. Uh, we have a very specific mission to spread as much education on the cannabis industry as possible. This is to help folks understand what uh, what some of the opportunities in the workforce that would be available. And in doing that, we, we do provide a basic level of education to get folks kind of caught up um, with the various uh, terminologies and vernacular that's generally used in the industry. Uh, and, and so we, we are state funded. Um, we do provide training both in person and online on demand. Our trainings are, uh, are again, it's career exploration. And we work in partnership with the universities and colleges all across the state to, for a number of reasons, to you know help attract folks who are most impacted by the prohibition of cannabis, which is uh, stated in our mission statement, and also to to help uh, folks uh, understand what are some of the low, lower hanging fruits that um, are available that uh, could be taught in, in the classes or folks to. Um, kind of get ready for the industry. Uh, to date, um, the Rockefeller report that was released a few years ago said that there's going to be anywhere from 30 to 50,000 jobs in the cannabis industry. And those jobs are going to range everywhere from uh, anywhere from uh, entry, the majority of the entry level, uh, and, and those are going to be time touching, uh, cultivation, extraction, manufacturing, uh, retail dispensing. Uh, distribution and delivery, and 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 also uh, lab uh, lab testing, which is super important. And as I was uh, hearing about the presentation um, of what Buffalo is going to do, I started thinking, I might come back to school because that is really cool on um, what you guys are doing here. Um, those those instruments, very fancy instruments, um, analyze plants in a lot of different ways, which help the workforce be able to communicate to the consumer what they're consuming. Also, ensure that we're consuming safe products. And that's first and foremost is safety, right? We want to consume safe uh, safe products. Um, just by a quick show of hands, anybody currently in the cannabis industry, working in the cannabis industry? Wow. So I'm talking to the choir here. All right. Well, if, if you get, uh, if you know all of this stuff, you know, forgive me. Um, but this is kind of basic to kind of help patch people up on, on some of the terminologies. So again, um, our roots and mission, we were established, uh, the, the, the Workforce Development uh, Institute and Cornell established CWI in 2019. And with a mission to promote and support social equity in the adult use cannabis market. And I'm sorry to the camera guy, I do walk around a lot. Um, cannabis plant anatomy. Uh, the cannabis plant is an annually harvest dioecious, which means both male and female, flowering herb. The plant consists of root, stalk, stems, leaves, leafy inflorescence, the buds, and reproductive organs. The beautiful look at the plant, you know, the top of the buds are going to be called the cola in general, generally. And you have, uh, you know, the stigma, which are these little uh, hair-like uh, 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 parts of the plant that come out, the bracts and the calyx, which uh, cover in the female, the oval, which is where the, the seed would be produced. 
and then the you know the beautiful uh, well-known fan leaves uh, and for um, you know manufacturing of the plant cultivation of the plant there is a process where we where we uh, propagate or create clones from the plant it's important to know um, these terminologies the node uh, the node is where the, the plant will offshoot from the main stem. And then between each node is what we call the internode. Uh, female plant, uh, again, you, you, it's kind of covered by the ovules, is covered by the, the, the calyx, um, which is where the seed production is going to happen. And you'll, you'll distinguish the two between the male and the female with these hairs, these hair like part, uh, um, parts that come off of the plant. So uh, cannabis roots, um, with the tap root specifically, this is generally going to be produced by a plant that's uh, started from a seed. Whereas if you're creating, if you're propagating a plant and or taking a clone, you're not necessarily going to have a tap root, but you would have the fibrous roots and the vintageous roots. Life cycle of the plant. Of course, all plants start from uh, seed. Uh, you plant the seed, you get germination. Um, which is when the, the seed first sprouts, and that's the sprout. And then you get a seedling, a little bit more uh, plant structure, roots. And then you get into the vegetative cycle, which is now when the plant is going to grow tall and, and start putting out its leaves and get bushy. Um, that's just generally going to be um, within a month of uh, the seedling process. And then after, when the light starts to shift and decrease, uh, the, the plant signals, uh, the, the plant gets a signal and says, okay, um, falls around the corner, I'm about to die, and you create more surface area and you create more uh, aromatic uh, presence in, the, in, in, in my environment, and it starts to bud out. And that's what we call the flowering stage. Uh, this photo period, um, which is the light period, this is, uh, this is based on the state of New York um, uh, light periods. Um, so this is uh, hours per month, and as you can see, um, in New York, generally you're you're seeding from March, April, and you know um, if if you're not seeding by next week, um, you might be a little late um, if you're planning on going outdoors. Um, vegetative cycle is going to be May to about July, and then you have the highest point of uh, or the longest day of the year, um, and after that. Uh, the, the sunlight starts to decrease every single day and the plants is freaking out. It needs to create a new lineage. It needs to create babies. And so now it's going to flowery cycle. Flowering in the state of New York is going to be anywhere from July to October, although I've seen some go into even early November. And um, harvesting is going to happen between October and November um, if you're outdoor, right? This is all outdoor because as you know, um, folks are growing indoors and can harvest all year round um, because they're manipulating the environment to uh, trick the plant to believe it's an outdoor. They're setting the light, the humidity, uh, temperatures accordingly. Some of the definitions, uh, strains, phenotypes, clones, land races. Strains kind of distinguish um, what the lineage of the plant is. Although I, I want folks to kind of um, keep in mind that um, you know, you may have Blue Dream in Buffalo. I might have Blue Dream in the Hudson Valley. My earth is different than yours. Your rain is different than mine. If we're both growing outside in the same year, the chemical expression may be different from strain to strain. And then even in breeding, uh, you may breed a plant here that, you know, the genetic expression goes one way and I might be breeding the same strain over there and the genetic expression might go a different way. So it's a little confusing when you, when you hear, oh, I have blue dream, but there may be 300 different types of blue dream when you start analyzing it and start looking at the terpene profiles and, and the cannabinoid structures, uh, flavonoid profiles, uh, phenotypes. Uh, I like to I like to talk about me and my brother during this time because me and my brother look completely different, although we're from the same parents. And and so a phenotype can be the, the it would be the uh, the the babies the the children of a particular uh, strain in the next generation. Uh, but they each might have their own characteristics. Some may present stronger. So if you're like you ever heard the terminology phenohunting, 
This is when we are looking for the, the babies that present uh, that present the more sturdy stock that are better for the environment. Not all seeds from the same plant are created equal. Like children are not created equal unless they're twins, right? Uh, clones, these are going to be identical twins because they're literally coming off of the mother plant um, during, through, through a process called propagation. And uh, you're, you're taking cuttings from the node, um, right off of the node of the mother plant, and you're putting it into um, some aeroponics where you're spraying water underneath it and getting the roots to kind of explode out. And then you're going to transfer those little babies with now roots into pots and then put it into its life cycle. Again, uh, clones do not have tap roots. Um, land race uh, strains. These are strains that have been around for upwards of a thousand years or more that have literally defined their expression based on the land that they were in for so many years. And it's important to know uh, that with land race strains, uh, there are, you know, these are the, the fine strains in the world. And this is going to come from originally from China and onto the Silk Road down to uh, Northern Africa and India uh, and around the 1400s when, when the Spaniards, because Morocco was right there, they're getting off a lot of uh, cannabis seeds into Spain and Europe at that time. They brought over the, their land race strains to uh, South America. Now, I just said that land race strains may, be, uh, may have been around for upwards of a thousand years or more. But 1400, that's not really a thousand years, right? We're talking maybe about seven to eight years in that time frame of those strains being present in South America. But we like to say that South America has land race strains because they have been around so long. And with the cannabis plant, because it dies every single year and comes back every single year, it has an opportunity to evolve and to adapt to its environment. And so we like to think that the South American strains, we like to call them land race strains, although they haven't been around technically for a thousand years or more. And just a little bit about the strains, you may have heard about some of these. Again, you know, Afghani, grown in Afghanistan, you know, for a thousand years. And then Afghani grown in my backyard for two years are gonna be two completely different products. They're gonna be two completely different chemical spectrums. Tawar is gonna be different. How it expresses is gonna be completely different. So are they really the same strain at that point? Well, we say they are because they come from the genetic lineage, but we don't wanna confuse people in thinking that because you consume a, a strain from the same lineage over here, that it's gonna be the same effect over here. And that's important, especially for medical patients that are looking for a very specific desired effect. Chemical profiles, everybody knows about the cannabinoids. Cannabinoids are what the industry has pretty much built itself around. And there's a little bit of a shift going on now. And we're going to talk about that later on today in our topology course, where we're finding out that terpenes are really driving these cannabinoids and creating and uh, creating effects that are really what we're desiring. And we didn't really know this until maybe the last decade. We're finding this out. Um, uh, something that we do know is that the majority of people, when they purchase cannabis, when they get an opportunity, they purchase with their nose. They want to smell, right? And we as humans have figured out that when we smell something we like and we associate that with a feeling or an effect that we like, we can continue to go back to that smell and we can continue to get similar effects based on those aromatics. And that's going to be driven largely by terpenes. And I know I just kind of skipped over cannabinoids because I feel like a lot of people know about cannabinoids and terpenes. We should be talking a lot more about that. But before I do get back into terpenes, you know, THC is the main player. Um, it's the one that everybody is really developing this industry around. It has a psychoactive effect. Uh, CBG, uh, CBN, THEA, CB, CBD, obviously, you all, every, uh, I think everybody's heard of CBD. It's a non-psychoactive, not, has non-psychoactive properties. Well, going back to the aromatics and the flavor profile, 
And I'll kind of get into this um, later on this afternoon during the terpology class. I actually have uh, hemp derived terpenes. So folks and staff, don't worry, I'm not bringing in cannabis to the university. Um, but these are, I'll be able to pass them around and you'll be able to take a nice whiff of it. And we'll talk about how to remember those smells because actually um, smelling, um, it's, it's a really funny things that human beings do. Um, it connects directly to our memory. And, and we can actually do it, uh, a really good job at remembering these smells and associating those smells with effects. And the research that we use for our course is provided by Dr. Ethan Russo via True Terpenes, which is a company out of the West Coast. Trichomes. So trichomes are, are these little bulbous things right here, right? This is where all of the chemicals that we're looking for live. When we're talking about CBD, when we're talking about terpenes, when we're talking about flavonoids, when we're talking about anything that we like about this time, the majority of it is gonna be found in these trichomes. And this is a, a, a capitate uh, a stock trichome with a bulbous head on it. There are many different types of trichomes. There are, uh, and we'll go over that later on today in our in our course. So the ones that we uh, look for are these, uh, uh, you know, again the capitate stock trichome, and these hold the greatest uh, amounts of concentration of aromatic and psychotropic compounds. And when you get into extractions and all that, they're literally pulling those trichomes off to, to break them out. And there's lipids, fats in them, oils, right? And, and all of the good stuff is in there. Here's a list of terpenes and we'll go over, um, today we'll probably go over maybe about five to seven of them, depending on how much time we have. Um, I generally carry around um, 16 uh, isolated terpene uh, vials with me. Growing environments. So cannabis can be grown in a multitude of ways, but naturally it grows outdoors. And that kind of speaks for itself. We also grow cannabis in hoop houses and greenhouses. Uh, this is a, a way to kind of control the environment just a little bit more than you would uh, in an indoor facility. In outdoor um, cultivation, um, you're really exposed to everything. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because the plant does adapt and can fight off uh, or um, create alliances in the soil with various microbes and, uh, and, and beneficial bugs um, to help it thrive and succeed in an outdoor environment. Whereas in a greenhouse, there is a spectrum of greenhouses. You have some greenhouses where they're just putting plastic over um, you know, dirt, right? And so you're still dealing with the, the natural environment to an extent, but this person may be trying to, like in New York, in the later uh, September, October seasons, it gets really wet here. And plants really don't like to be in a humid environment, particularly at the end of its life cycle. They're cool with it during the spring because it's spring, a lot of rain. And so humidity in the, in the spring, you know, they're, they're, more, uh, they're more adaptable. They can, they can fend for themselves. But towards the end of the season, it starts to rain a lot here. And so folks are generally trying to cover maybe with a hoop house or a greenhouse. Their crops are not, uh, not taking all of that humidity. Blow some fans. Now in, uh, actually I'll go back to this, but then that's one side of the spectrum, right? And then on the other side of the spectrum of the greenhouse is what we call hybrid greenhouses, where folks are literally sealing in a facility, growing, you know, concrete floors with tables and buckets on top, um, create, simulating an indoor environment with the use of the sun, supplementing that sun. And they could, uh, during a specific time of the year, uh, cover the cover the, the the roof, which is called light deprivation, uh, so that it can so that the plant can sim be simu simulate the flowering cycle. Um, that's particularly um, during times of the year where the sun, um, like in May, June, when you're trying to uh, flower your plants and there's too much sun out, you need to cover the greenhouses to deprivate the plants from the sun. 
And these, these greenhouses are very, they can act very similarly to an indoor facility in terms of the biosecurity structures. And we'll talk, we'll touch on biosecurity and integrated pest management. Um, so there's a spectrum of greenhouses. They're real rugged, you know, seeds in the dirt to very advanced, almost like building type greenhouses. And from the picture what I saw, maybe Buffalo might have something like that. Indoor cultivation. Uh, indoor cultivation is going to be your most secure form of cultivating. And indoor cultivation is particularly important, again, for patients that are really requiring uh, a plant with the same effects every single time. When you put a plant outdoors, your, you know, the chemical profile can change based on, you know, too much rain or too little rain. Last year, we had a drought in New York, which was actually not the worst thing that ever happened. Uh, personally analyzing cannabis in the state for many years. Last year, I saw some of the most trichome production in the state that I've ever seen. And it makes sense because trichomes do protect the plant from a lot of sun. And when you have a drought and there's not a lot of rain or cloud cover, now these, sun, now these plants outdoors are just being bombarded by sun rays. And um, the outdoor production last year was pretty silly in terms of like how much trichomes uh, we were able to see. It was, it was pretty amazing. But in indoor, it's not really subject to the variation of environment, environmental changes. It's not really subject to whether I had too much rain or too little rain because we precisely dose each plant with as much water as we want. We give it specific amount of humidity. We give it a specific temperature. We give it specific amounts of light. And so you can reproduce the same plant over and over again, reproducing the same effects without changing the chemical structure too much, which is again, very important, especially for medical patients that have found a particular strain or genetic expression of a plant that really works for their condition. And you wanna keep on reproducing that, indoor is gonna be the best way to do that. As I said earlier, uh, temperature and humidity is going to, uh, the, the desire from the plant is going to shift for more humidity up front, less humidity towards the end of its life cycle. And, you know, temperatures are going to be anywhere from the 70s, mid 70s to the mid 80s. Uh, and that's kind of where, where it likes uh, to live. Post-growing environments, after the plant is harvested, you get a plant that's really heavy and there's a lot of uh, moisture content in it and that moisture content needs to be removed. So the first thing you do after we harvest the plant is dry it. And drying is gonna be in a, in a controlled facility. The temperature is gonna be between 60 to 65 uh, degrees with uh, humidity at uh, 50 to 60% at the highest. And you'll, you'll run it in there for a few weeks until the moisture content is uh, what, whatever the cultivator um, desires. And then from there, it goes into curing, which is a little bit of a different process, but not too different. And this is in the curing process. This is where we, where we basically harden those trichomes and keep them preserved so that those, um, those aromatic expressions and those cannabinoids are can can live in the plant for a longer period of time uh and and also if you, you ever take up i should ask that question we we don't um endorse or promote uh, cannabis use um so the um the what we do say is um when it's improperly cured for instance um you you'll take the butt and you'll take a sniff of it and and the minute you you, you take it away from your nose that smell is gone Right, that's not the best cure. But if it lingers, if that smell lingers, that means that there is a, a you know, this uh, ambient and uh, ambient uh, aromatic environment that was rich and just kind of like lives around, lives in your face. And for maybe uh, twenty to thirty seconds afterwards, that's a better cure. And these are um, practices that are taken on by sommeliers of cannabis um, and that are determined with their nose and their eyes. Um, good versus bad. Not sure it's the most objective, but it's getting it's getting us somewhere. And same thing with wine, right? Uh, wine, uh, you have sommeliers for wine, and uh, they're 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 describing the expression of the 
uh, of, of wine based on what they're smelling, what they're seeing, what they're tasting. This is now currently happening with cannabis. Lots of environmental threats. That's why it's so important to have labs, quality assurance and quality control in the industry. And I have academic institutions breaking out all of the machines. I don't think you guys missed one. I've never seen a uh, university or a college um, today, and I've been around in this industry for many decades now, um, put, to, put all of these machines together in one program. So kudos to Buffalo. That, that's kind of like, I was like sitting in my chair, like, oh my God, I have an NMR. Um, it's crazy. Um, but it's, this is going to help us determine, you know, how these, um, where these guys live, where these threats are, how they present, how to, uh, how to mitigate those and, and even treat them. But most importantly, keep the consumers safe because, you know, consuming mold and mildew, putting that into your lungs is a very, very bad thing, as you know. And also there's some um, posters outside that have the, uh, that I just put up and some of you were already in here when I did put them up that have the beneficial uh, versus the threatening type bugs. Um, so you can go ahead and take a picture. There's QR codes on the bottom of them on all of our posters at CW and you can take a picture of it and you can access all of those posters and you can print them out, put them up in your bedroom or in your classrooms. Um, everybody's welcome to it, it's state funded, so it's free. Um, basic nutrients and minerals. Now, people get really creative with um, how they feed their plants, but at the very basic level of it, all plants really um, for cannabis and, and most of outside of cannabis, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and some cow mag, magnesium, calcium. Uh, I'm, how am I doing on time, Joanne? <laughs> 10 more minutes? Okay, so I am moving through it uh, quite as quickly as possible. Um, but again, also, this whole presentation is available. Uh, if you use those QR codes outside that are on the big posters, you can download this presentation and have it for your own use. And, and please share it. You know, we get into, uh, I, I do, this year we're, we're getting into living soil and, and what, it, what it looks like to produce your own soil. Um, and at, the very, at a very fundamental level, there are, uh, to create living soil, you need a lot of different things and, and, and basically you're facilitating an environment that's not really, able, you're able to control, right? You got bugs and natural animals, wildlife, um, some farmers like myself, I have chickens, goats, sheep, uh, ducks, I'm bringing in pigs this year um, to kind of help facilitate. I farm, I, I breed uh, my own bugs, uh, everything from worms to black soldier fly larvae. Um, because they're all doing something for us. And I also personally don't, poly I don't monocrop, meaning that I don't just grow wheat, I polycrop. So a byproduct of my crop is usually sofrito, as for Puerto Rican, that's going to be, uh, you know, cilantro, oregano, uh, you know, all the, all the stuff. So I, I generally have gardens growing and fruit, um, I have an orchard. And because I have all of these things going on, I can ferment some fruit, I can ferment some plants, I can make my own juices. Um, this is also known as Korean natural farming for some of you that I see some eyes and I know you know so um, but this is kind of getting into living soil uh, living soil generally doesn't work inside of a indoor facility yet um, most time when you're bringing soil into a facility you have to pasteurize and heat it up really a lot and try to get all the bugs and microbes out of it um, there are some innovators I know Raven Views um, innovating the you know this idea of bringing in uh, hybrid living soils uh, to their cultivation facilities to have uh, almost like a terroir expression um, that's really not found indoor yet. Um, but again, we're we're we we are seeing innovation happening, and we might be able to see that come indoors uh, shortly. It's just really hard to do inside because then you're fighting everything that that soil is bringing in without all of the other environmental support. Soilless media, uh, and as you know, I'm going to name them from vermiculite down, but these are also in order of the way that they're named. So vermiculite on top, clay pellets, expanded shale, peat moss, coca core, and perlite. Um, this is important because, as I said before, not a lot of people can use living soil. The majority of people don't use living soil inside of an indoor facility. 
Uh, it's harder to control the nutrient uptake. It's hard, it's just hard, right? So when you have uh, carbon-based uh, soils that can absorb the nutrients that you give it, uh, it be, it's easier to control what your plants are eating and or drinking. And, and so some of this is done individually. Um, the majority of cultivators will do a mixture of some of these um, different soilless medias. But expanded shale and, and the um, clay pellets, you'll find those oftentimes on their own. Some hydroponics for everyone. Uh, aeroponics, so you have uh, water being sprayed up to the roots with uh, a layer of air in the middle, uh, deep water culture, you're filling it up with water and you're, and you're generally aerating the water with lots of bubbles uh, and your roots are just completely soaked as you can see right here in the deep water culture. Uh, drip system, uh, this is you know, basically a tape that kind of like, I think this is, yeah, this is a drip system right here. Um, you're just basically uh, dripping uh, your, your, your water and also your nutrients into into the plant uh, pots and then nft also a uh, nutrient film technique which is also known as nft right here it's kind of like a hybrid between deep water and aeroponics aquaponics this is done with fish uh, i have myself have done this with 300 tilapia uh, with two tanks similar to this um, I was not very good at it. Um, my bud tasted very disgusting, um, but that's because I had a biofilt. I was new to building biofilters and didn't really do it in the best way possible. So there are a lot of people that are trying to figure this out and creating biofilters that uh, can produce quality cannabis. And it's really um, an interesting uh, system. Yeah, please come on in. Um, really an interesting system because it's closed loop. You got the fish creating your, your the food the food for the plant, and also the tank water is feeding the plant water and 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 nutrients. And then you're circulating that water back down to the fish, which is really cool. Um, I highly recommend um, having a way to heat the fish if you're in an uh, area that has uh, winter. Um, I did not have all the foresight in the summer. I was really excited to do it and ended up building a makeshift uh, fireplace and ran copper coils and filtering out my water to keep my fish alive because they were just popping up and dying on me. Um, so you want to be very careful because you are taking care of life and, um, and also the fish can be really delicious when served with a cannabis infused meal. <laughs> not that I am recommending that because we don't promote that. Um, LED lights, um, LED, uh, high pressure sodium, HPS as we know it, um, metal halide. Uh, HPS and metal halide were really the workhorses of this industry for a very long time. Because prohibition, we were forced to grow cannabis indoors. We had to hide these plants. And now we don't have any sun and we need to produce and simulate uh, enough sunlight inside of these facilities uh, to do that. And, and so HPS and metal halide, metal halide really for the first vegetative cycle of the plant is kind of producing that blue spectrum like the spring light. And then you got that deep yellow um, from, the, from the HPS, like, you know, midsummer hot day. Um, and, and these do generate a lot of heat and also consume a lot of electricity. Now, because of innovation, uh, we are now seeing really good LED lights come out that create a, a full spectrum of light um, and that are that are beneficial to the plant and, and all of its cycles. And you can even control the spectrum as you know for particular stages of the plant. Uh, there has been a lot of studies done, uh, you know, independent and also academic to kind of figure out like what's the what's what's happening here with the price point? Is it really worth it? it when I switch to LED, am I losing money? Um, you know, but when you look at a commercial facility and the cost of energy, and you look at the output of what's coming out in LED, actually LED is producing profits, more profits than you would get from HPS or metal halide um, because of the energy consumption uh, that's being required by HPS and metal halide. Uh, but some older school growers are, you know, really just are stuck in their ways and really prefer that. I, I, I hope that they're experimenting with LEDs for the sake of our planet, right? Because we need to like breathe air and drink water. 
Um, and I've got a few more minutes, so I'll just kind of rush through this a little. Um, integrated pest management, also known as IPM. This is how co commercial cultivations, um, indoor and outdoor, approach their the, the way to uh, prevent, treat, mitigate pests. And so there's evaluation, pest ID, prevention, monitoring, choosing options and actions. Uh, you, you might see in a cultivation, yellow stickies kind of in the canopy. And when a cultivator is going around, they might pick up that sticky and they'll see, oh, a bug got stuck to it. And they can identify that bug and then they can identify a treatment for that, uh, for that crop. Um, also, uh, when you're dealing with the plant, uh, some folks uh, have arm sleeves that are yellow and, you know, the bugs might be attracted to them. So while they're in the canopy defoliating and just doing their day-to-day -day job, they may be able to pick up uh, an infestation. These are practices that are part of IPM. Uh, biosecurity is more associated with the structural integrity of the facility, how air is being moved in the facility, how doors are being either left open or closed, how the building is literally designed and constructed to prevent uh, any bio threats uh, to the facility. So for instance, your, your nursery, which is uh, gonna be your most uh, vulnerable stage of the plant, um, may be positively pressured with air so that when you open up that door, there's wind coming at you and not being sucked in because imagine spores from the outside vestibules coming into that room, uh, that could be an issue. So HVAC, the, the facility layout, where that nursery is, all of those considerations are what we are thinking about when we're thinking about biosecurity. So more, um, more preventative, more foresight um, and, and thought put into uh, how you lay out your facility, um, whereas IPM is your day-to-day -day maintenance and actions. Um, we've got some glossary here. Again, uh, this is going to be found on our on on our website out, uh, which you can get from our QR code outside. And there was a cannabis plant science music video that I can't show right now because it's not working. But um, we are at the end of our time here, um, and you can also see those music videos. I have a bunch of them on YouTube, and so you go to uh, NY Cannabis Workforce on YouTube and enjoy some music videos. Um, some of them are like, you know, five minutes. Some of them are four minutes with 20 seconds afterwards. You know, they're cool videos. Um, we cover everything from terpenes, cannabinoids, the various jobs in the industry from seed to sale, cannabis, plant science, and more. Thank you so much. I hope you guys have a good day. All right, thank you, David Serrano. So as a reminder, Dave has a table out outside, outside the room. So if anyone, again, looking for a job or looking to employ people or just wants to talk more about what he shared, you can find information there. We will all be at lunch together. And we will also, um, we will have Q&A after the last two speakers of the morning and this in the afternoon. So you'll have a chance to ask questions here as well as at lunch. So our next presenter is Michael Kudrevich from Ravens Genetics. He's going to be piggybacking off of some of what David shared as it relates to land race genetics and why he chooses to focus on those cultivars. So, Hey everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, David, uh, thanks for making it so hard to follow you today. <laughs> Did a great job. Um, Okay, so as, as my wife Joanne said, we're Ravens Eugenetics. We're based in Delhi, New York, uh, in the Catskills, Southern Tier. And um, yes, I like to focus on land race genetics. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, I guess the first thing we're going to look at is what are genetics? What does that word genetics really mean? Um, it, you know, obviously it's pretty, pretty straightforward, but a lot of people don't understand it. It is really the, the backbone and the makeup of each plant and the way that it interacts with yourself and each other. Um, you know, so it's just something that it, it's the, it's the core root of everything we want to look at when we're, we're dealing with cannabis. And in my opinion, what's kind of been happening in the industry is, uh, well, actually I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Well, we can start the evolution of genetics. Uh, a lot of this is, you know, from my personal experience, but a lot of it is pretty much documented uh, where in the evolution, you know, uh, initially, as David was talking about with the land race genetics, uh, pretty much plants that were isolated and 
in one area and not affected by any other inbreeding or hybridization. What happens with the plant, it, it, it assimilates itself to the, 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 the soil, to the environment, to the sun, to the rain. Uh, one thing I like to use as a good example is Hawaii. Hawaii had no cannabis in it. Pretty much Hawaii didn't have a lot of things. There wasn't a lot of stuff that we think of Hawaii as being indigenous. Uh, so you get in, say, the, the Pali Coast, you get an area in the, in the mountain region where you have genetics. You have some reason they, they plant some seeds there. They've been grown over for you know a couple hundred years, a hundred years, even ten or twenty years. They start to acclimate to that particular soil, to the way that it interacts with the environment. Uh, and also, as David uh, nicely pointed out, when we take those genetics out of there, they're not going to be identical unless we start trying to emulate the 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 environment they come from, bringing soil in, bringing you know you know monitoring the weather and creating that within our with our grows, which isn't really all that practical. Uh, but we can do the best we can with those types of uh, environments. Um, so going on to, you know, fourth birthing, the, the evolution of genetics. Okay, 60s, pre-70s, you know, you know pre-70s, uh, a lot of stuff we had was that I personally was exposed to, you know, was Mexican, Jamaican, Colombian cannabis. Uh, those strains were very low in, in THC for the most part. But what I like to see, like, you know, when I say when I was in high school, I smoked a joint before homeroom. I was good until lunch. You know, the, it, had, it had long legs. And it's because we had a full entourage effect at that point. Nobody was really messing around with the genetics of it. They weren't breeding for high THC. They weren't trying to specifically breed for different aspects and pull at different aspects out of the plant. So it worked. Even though, again, it was much lower. For a million, your average THC content is 5 to 6%. But it, it, it lasted a long time. And I, I know as a kid, I thought I was getting high as heck, you know, but I mean, nowadays, I mean, you know, your cannabis, you know, 25, 30% uh, THC, it's a different high for me. It's a very different feeling. And I like to go on to, um, you know, we'll circle back to that in a little bit. So in the beginning, we had the Mexican, the Jamaican, Colombia, that's pretty much what you got. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of the stuff, there was some great Mexican cannabis out there, but that wasn't what was getting if you got Acapulco gold, you're really fortunate. A lot of times you got Mexican brick weed. We call that headache weed. To me, it was kind of like drinking Budweiser. Um, it wasn't something you, you got it because it was what was around. Um, your Colombian, you know, was, there's a base of Colombian and you had your Colombian red, your Colombian gold from different regions of Colombia. Um, that was pretty much the norm for what we would get. And it worked. Uh, it, it also, another thing that worked with it, it was filled with seeds. I mean, anybody from that era remembers pulling out an album cover because that was the go-to and fold that album cover and you cleaned your weed on an album cover. All the seeds would roll out, you get it out and then you, you'd, you'd roll your product. And then of course you'd have people, you know, that didn't do that and you'd be smoking a joint. There'd be like flares coming off of it as the seeds are cooking up and popping and going everywhere. Um, so we've got that down pretty good where we're not smoking cannabis with seeds in it. So that's, that's a good direction. Um, then we go to the transitional time which is and a lot of this is from my experience of what I experienced in the industry as I saw how it evolved. Uh, in the transitional time, you started having your, your, your Southeast Asian and your Hawaiian in, uh, strains coming in. And pretty much all these strains are the ones that said that, that that's, all, that's all stuff that I've, I've worked with and I've grown, except this is a skunk, uh, skunk number one. That's not my product. Um, but anyway, in, in transitional time, you start having a lot of, you know, Vietnam, Vietnam War was winding down. And unfortunately, war really did transport cannabis throughout the, throughout the world quite a bit. Um, you started getting Vietnamese, Laos, Thai strains coming in. And they started, they had some, a lot more natural potency to them. They had a much more psychoactive effect. It was very different from the other stuff that we were used to, from the Mexican, Jamaican, and Colombian. Um, and then you started having, at that point, the Hawaiians started coming in. Uh, and you spend then that sense of mill, you know, basically people started working with the plant a little bit more than what they were prior and started getting that seedless cannabis for us. And it was more potent. It's basically kind of, you, you take away the male plant, all that female plant wants to do is it wants to produce seeds to produce its, you know, to, to carry on its lineage. And part of what happens is when you eliminate that male plant from it, and it, the, the, the females goes further and further, it pushes more THC and more cannabinoids and terpenes because that's what's going to help capture any pollen. And it's kind of like it starts, the plant almost starts getting nervous that it's not going to be able to reproduce. And that's why it pushes so much more. Uh, that's different than feminized. The feminized plant, it's just going to do it naturally. So you're not going to get the same effect from a, semi, a, a, a feminized plant as you are from an actual true sense of mill. 
Um, and basically the sensor mill is removing your male plants from your females. So they just keep wanting to do that reproduction and they keep pushing more of their terpenes, cannabinoids and THC. Um, so shortly thereafter, and you know, really it started Sam to skunk man pretty much took an Afghani strain and developed skunk number one and brought it into Holland in the early eighties. That's when we started to have hybridization really, when we started seeing that happen. Uh, skunk number one was pretty much the backbone of a lot of your hybrids that are out there. Your original hybrids just started coming in. Uh, it was it was very stabilized and it worked well. It was very good to breed with and it had a short flower time. That's why it was such a popular strain to work with. Uh, so going on a little bit beyond that, um, okay, you have what I like to consider pure hybrids. If you look at genetics in like a lot of your older strains, You'll see what they have. They may have two, three, four different strains in them, but they're land race strains. They're from different regions of the world combined to get that real nice magical mix. Uh, and another big thing about hybridization is your anything that's close to the equator, equatorial, uh, they have a much longer flower time. You know, it's not a commercial viable, they're, they're not commercially viable. They're between 12. Some of them even going up to like some of your Southeast Asians or your, you know, Highland Colombians, they go up to 20 weeks flower time. Well, that's there's just no way anybody commercially is going to do that. When you could flip four other sites, three other cycles in that same time almost, it's going to be a lot more profitable. So what you have people do, you get in, you start bringing your Afghani strains, your Middle Eastern strains, uh, some of your Mediterranean strains that have a very fast flower time. And that's why hybridization, a lot of the reasons hybridization has really gotten popular because you can take those Colombian, those Thai strains, and you can mix them with the, a, excuse me, a Moroccan strain or an Afghani strain, and you work that flower time down. And it's not just, that doesn't just happen over one, one breeding cycle. To really get that genetic stabilized, you need to do it three, four, five times, even six times to get something very stable and it's going to reproduce the same product every time you know as david was saying even just different you know you know you know regions and taking the same genetic blue dream you grow at one spot you grow at another spot it's going to be different but still going to have the same possible innate abilities that's bred into the genetic it's not it's not lost it's just how you are able to bring the expression of those genetics out uh so like i know what i do how i grow something and, and David said, I do something very different. I'm working on a kind of a, a commercial type grow method, but incorporating microbial life. Uh, like one of my benchmarks is if uh, and a lot of people freak out and they start growing, they see this little bug in their soil. A lot of times it's white. It's called a springtail. Well, if you to, to me, the springtail is the canary in the coal mine. If I see springtails in my in my soil, I know that I'm not using too much uh nutrient or anything because i don't go i'm not totally organic i do use some very relatively benign nutrients and i mix that in with some other additives that i put in my soil so again that's kind of like the canary in the coal mine it tells me i'm doing something really well because the way that the cannabis uptakes nutrients is when you have your nutrient in the soil cannabis a lot of times not even organic nutrients are not readily available to the plant all the time so when you've got something like you have your microbial life, you know, and even going beyond microbial with, with your springtails, they're consuming the nutrients and their defecant is what then feeds the plant because it's already been processed down and the plant can absorb that nutrient at a different and a much natural rate and a much more efficient rate. So again, with your initial hybridization, you still didn't start, you still had pretty much pure, pure plant that you're working with. And then as things started going on, um, you know, it takes time to do that, to start with a raw land race genetic and mix those and to get something that's really viable. So people started taking shortcuts. They started taking different hybrids, different hybrids, different hybrids. They start interbreeding them. And now you have some of these strains out there. If you look at the, the, the genetic makeup, it's like a, 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 a compulsive criminal rap sheet. I mean, it's longer than my arm when you look at some of this stuff. And what, so you, you start having a breakdown of, there, there's loss to that in the sense that um, one thing that really happens is hybrids take a lot more nutrient, especially these super hybrids. They take a lot more nutrient to get 
the same result that you would from a land race chain. Like I said, say take a land race, uh, a Colum Highland Colombian sativa, you want to give that very little nutrient because you'll actually, it'll, 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 too much nutrient will be an adverse effect on the plant. You'll start to see right away your, the tips of your, 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 uh, the apex of your, of your, of your leaves are going to start to crisp up. That's too much nutrient. Then you can even wind up getting nutrient lockout. So from a commercial standpoint, if you're pounding out a whole lot of, you know, wedding cake and all these, you know, poly hybrids, you've got to give them a lot more nutrient to get the same effect. That if you're going back to something like a chem dog or an original OG, or even going back all the way back to an original land race, um, you know, so, and I, I mean, I've done it. I've feminized, the way that I got my license was I, I produced feminized seed for the hemp growers, which is a chemical process. It's not a natural process. It's a chemical process. So you've already, now you've altered that plant to a point where, you know, with the feminized seed, it's not coming back. It's altered. That's what it is. It's in its DNA. It's in its genetic now. Um, they do have a tendency. And, and there's a lot of argument about this in the industry um, that some people say that, well, your feminized seed is a lot more prone to be hermaphroditic, which nobody wants hermaphrodites in their grow. I mean, one hermaphrodite can roll. I mean, if you're indoors, it's, it's contained. It, it, it can ruin your whole grow. If you're outdoors, that could spread. I mean, technically, pollen could go, I mean, in optimum conditions, go up to 30 miles. I mean, standardly about three miles is what they'll say. But still, you know, you wind up, you know, crossbreeding and have, a, you know, you just, you wind up with seeded, seeded product at that point in time, which nobody, it's just, commercially, that's not viable. That's going to, that's going to kill you if you wind up having a, a, an instance where your whole field goes to, you know, seeded crop. Um, so going on from there, and like my, this is just my opinion. You know, take it for what it's worth. Um, my background is in art. Okay, so I like to use the example of um, you start out with red, the colors red and blue, and you high and you mix those. You get purple. There's no way to reverse that and get red, red and blue back out of that purple. What will happen is the more pigment you keep putting into that to say, oh, I want to get back to that color, keep adding more pigment, adding more pigment. It will turn to the color of mud over time. It, it, it happens all the time. If you want to go and play with colors, do it. That's what will happen. It will turn to a color of mud. So you've lost your original genetic at that point. You know, if nobody else is preserving those genetics, there's no way to go back to them. You know, they're gone. That's it. You know, it's just, it, it, it is what it is. And that's what I feel is happening with a lot of our genetics in the industry. People are just inbreeding so much and they're just over hybridizing, over hybridizing. Um, okay. Uh, first, I'll use an example. My nephew, one effect that you have, my nephew, uh, the knucklehead that he is, I, you know, he's thinking, oh, I'm smoking this stuff that's 30, 35% THC. I gave him a joint of something I, I grow, La Buena Vida. Uh, it's 20% THC, but it has a full cannabinoid terpene profile. He smoked that joint and he, he smoked the whole joint. And he said, Uncle Michael, that was the worst night of my life. I didn't know you could get that high on, on weed. And because that's an original terpene profile that's there, it's got the full spectrum of everything the plant has to offer us. And, and, and the, the good thing that was encouraging to me, he got it, he understood it. The next day or a couple of days later when he you know, was able to go back to it, he smoked a couple of hits of it. And he said, "Wow, this is really nice. I really enjoyed that. It like it just changed things. There's there's a, there's a full spectrum to it, not just in the in the plant itself, but the way that, that the high affects you. It, there's ebbs and flows. Uh, I'm not sure how many people pay attention to this. But most people think, "Oh, I smoke a joint, I get high, and that's it." No, it's not. You smoke a joint. There's certain. It depends on the strain. Some strains will take you from a very high point and take you on a ride there and then kind of bring you down at the back end and be relaxing. Some could be the opposite of that. And some like, for instance, if I go back to like that one in the middle, that is uh, Mekong Delta. That is a Laos Cambodian strain they've been working with. Beautiful strain, great terpenes. Um, it's, a little, it's a little loose in its structure, which is another thing I'd like to just address in, in the industry where everyone looks for those rock hard buds. Um, That'll blow away most stuff on the market as far as the high. It's a very unique high. It's a very up high. And when you're done, you're just done. You don't, you just, you don't have that burnout or that, that drag on you. It's just like, oh, okay, I'm not high anymore. But that's also a three, four hour high. And that's what a lot of cannabis should be. 
You know, not these 45 minute, going back to my nephew, Uncle Michael, we smoke a joint, we order a pizza, by the time the pizza shows up, we're not high anymore. You know, so even if this stuff comes in at a higher price point, commercially, where's the value? If you have to smoke one joint for three, four hours, or you have to smoke three joints for three, four hours or something that's over hybridized, what's the better, where's your, your money best spent? So going back to where we were with the, the color and over hybridization. Um, so we want to, we need to address this. We need to look at this. And part of what I'm doing is I've been collecting land race genetics for 15 years. My morning has been sitting in front of when I'm eating breakfast, sitting in front of my iPad. And up till five years ago to find land race genetics on the internet was very difficult. You do a lot of reading, a lot of digging, a lot of searching. You get a lead, oh, and you think you hit on something, it's gonna be really good. And you get it, it's like, ah, no, it's something that really isn't, it's not really a land race. Um, so I've spent the last, you know, 10 years looking at my iPad. And, you know, it's maybe sorry to say is I, I went through like, it was one seed bank, Attitude Seed Bank. There's probably 3,500 different strains on that website. I read the description of every one of them probably twice, you know, and it's just going through. And for me, that's like almost reading a textbook because I, I keep basically stockpiling that knowledge about all the different genetics. And when I started to notice, going back to what I said, a lot of the really early strains were very potent, had three or four different land race genetics in them. And that was like, seemed like that was the sweet spot, you know, but it's kind of like music, you know, music is very different than it was back then. It's almost like a lot of your musicians will say, oh, there's nothing new coming out anymore. Everything's been done they're, they're altering they're doing they're just repeating it they're you know you got auto tune you've got this you've got that well that's kind of a good analogy to what's happening in the cannabis market you know i mean every when when cookies came out everybody bred into cookies okay when wedding cake came out everyone bred in the wedding cake now you have people breeding wedding cake and cookies together and, and it's just and and the highs are just for the most part is very homogenous there's no nuances there's no subtleties to it um again Red and blue make purple. You can't get it back. So what we're looking to do at Raven's View is create a land race seed bank with these genetics that I have. And the way I want to do that is anything that I have, I will open pollinate and I'll create a couple thousand seeds of that strain. So I'm going to encompass the entire genetic profile of that genetic in those seeds. And then what I would do is I take two thirds, three quarters of those, put them into a seed bank for perpetuity and keep the other quarter and work with developing those new hybrid strains that aren't technically polyhybrids or they're not gonna have that rap sheet of genetics in them and go back to those nuances and the, and the subtleties of what this plant and the medicinal value, you know, cause that's another big thing. Those original genetics, as David mentioned, that's where the gold is. That's where all the really good work can be done to find what's really there that's unadulterated, that isn't what somebody else's opinion should be or there or what they think. It's like for me, as I work with, as I, as I work and create that seed bank, the ones that I work with, that will then become what I feel the expression of that plant should be. But that's just my personal opinion. What your, what your opinion is, what your opinion, what you're looking for could be different. And the only way to, for you to search that and find that is having that seed bank to go to and draw from and work and, and do the work because it is work. It's a, there's a lot more work. If you start with a, <coughs> a land race genetic, now land race, they're not furled. They're not just wild. They've been cultivated by indigenous tribes or, or you know, communities for hundreds, thousands, hundreds of, you know, as far back as people have been using cannabis. Um, but it's not inbreeding. It's not, or it's not hybridizing. It's basically what we call an IBL, an inbred line, where we keep bringing back into that. To you know, we're going to take out the weaker plants as we're growing it out. If something's not. If you see, there's a nutrient deficient, gone. If it's more prone to pest pest attack, gone. So you wind up creating a strong, stable genetic with that plant that you could then use for a multitude of things you can you can extract you know the, the probably it'd be really interesting and i'm sure bill could maybe speak to this potentially or if there's his availability of, of old school genetics to work with and do research on it to find what is the the the, the innate benefit of having those land race genetics is there a higher cannabinoid? is there a higher terpene is there a higher 
THC. Well, it's not, I won't say high THC level because there really isn't on most of them, unless you get into some of your Southeast days or your Highland uh, Colombians, which, yeah, those things will rock you. They'll kick your ass. I mean, you could be talking nat a natural 25% THC combined with natural cannabinoid and terpene profiles. Yeah, you're going for a ride. You know, definitely. I mean, I've seen it happen to people, especially first time users, much to my chagrin with a girlfriend of mine one time when she took a hit of a tie stick and I had to get her past my parents after that. And that was no easy task. She was just, she was catching butterflies in the air that weren't there. Seriously, I'm not making that up. Um, and that's just smoking straight up land race genetics. Um, you know, so yeah, going back. So creating that seed bank for everybody to work off of, for everybody to have the availability to, and to dial back where we're going in this industry. Again, this is my opinion. It's just, it's what I believe. I'm not the only person that believes this. There are, there is a, a grassroots. There are people, there are people out there collecting still. There's some really good genetics out there. And as I mentioned earlier, it's easier to find those genetics online now than it was, you know, five years ago. There's a, there's a, there's quite a bit of it out there and they've been doing the work. They, you know, there's this one company I deal with, you know, they basically had a, uh, a, a Thai strain and a Pakistani strain that they collected and they worked with it for three years. They, they basically, they pheno hunted, you know? So in essence, what they did for the Thai strain, cause I'm not sure if you're familiar, but Thai strains have a tendency to get crazy big and unruly and out of control. So a lot of people say, well, you have to take that genetic and turn take it from a seed one or two weeks and throw it right in the flower. I'm not a big fan of that either because the plant hasn't matured yet in its vegetative state. It's going to be different at two weeks. And if you, you want to run something before you take cuttings or something, in my again, in my opinion, you want to run it at least eight weeks. Ten weeks is better because now you're starting to capture more of what that plant is capable of doing in its vegetative state. And when you get to some, again, I keep referencing the 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 the, the, the ties in the Highland Columbians because they have that longer that longer time frame. So. To, to grow out, um, you know, so you, you breed with those and you find the ones that are going to bring the flower time down. You find the ones that are going to, uh, are, are going to not have to be, you know, taken out of vegetative so quickly. Um, and that's what they did with this one strain. I'm, I'm running it right now. Uh, I'm going to be putting it out to the field. See how it's going to do. It's called Pack Race 75. Um, I'm pretty excited about it because it's, I mean, and again, they use that Pakistani to bring the flower time down of the, of the tide. Um, so, and that's pretty much kind of things in a nutshell. And, you know, I, I, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for, you know, making it out here. Thank you for paying attention. Uh, hope that there's some knowledge that comes from this for you. And, uh, and my wife hates this, but one of my little taglines is, Wofu, we're watching out for you. We got your back. And because somebody's got to do it. You know, if not, we're going to wind up with nothing but wedding cake and gelato and cookies. All right. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, I was asked to remind everybody that there's lots of uh, cakes and coffees and stuff. So please help yourself. We are going to break after this next presentation for lunch. And we'll walk you across to the next building. So our next presenters are Jim Bullman, and I don't know if Miranda Sherman is also coming up here. They are for the, from the Niagara Cannabis Company. They are processors and manufacturers. And what they are going to be speaking about is that relationship between the cultivator and the processor. Starting that conversation as a cultivator, what, are, what do you need to know from the processor? What can you do so that your product is better served when it's being processed um, and all of the things that relate in those areas of the supply chain. So I'm going to leave it to Bill. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Jim, what did I say? Bill? Sorry. sorry, I'll be a Bill. greater than mine. Yeah. <laughs> 50. Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Bowman. I'm from Nair Cannabis Company. Um, I'll give you a little history of where we started. It's a family-owned business. We started about five and a half years ago. We opened up One Hemp Holistics. It was a retail store. We started white labeling our products. Then we decided why we were doing this. Let's build a lab. So we built a GMP lab. So we started 
outsource in desolate, um, crudes, terps, and different oils. And we did SOPs and everything like that to do this lab. We started making our own products. Instead of buying products out, outsourcing them, we said, let's grow up. So we filed for our license, our hemp growing license. Then what you know what hemp growers did? They got their cannabis license. So we're awarded our cannabis license. Now we're in the process of building a bigger lab, GMP lab, to get um, cannabis products out there to New York State. And right now we're, we have eight employees. We have a Miranda over here, and my sister is my partner, and we have eight other employees, and we're ready to rock and roll on this. So on that note, we're going to start here and how farming practices influence the quality of the products. So that's our storefront right there. That's our, that's our story. I just gave you a little I'm down to that. Some of our team members right there are happy in the fall time. Okay. Am I on the right one, Melinda, here? How farming practices influence quality, processing, and extraction. Healthy plants equal higher yields and higher quality of material. Failure on the lab testing may result in. Hang on. Describe it. I got dyslexia, guys. So, like when I get nervous, my dyslexia comes in. I, I can't say. Failure in the lab may result in decrease in purchase price or destruction of your product. How to maintain a healthy crop. Let's go there. How to maintain a healthy crop. Have a solid IPM plan. Consider hiring an, ex an experienced individual to create or oversee your plan. Take preventative measures against pests and disease. It's easier to prevent a problem than to treat a problem. Use beneficial insects, bacteria, and fungi. We used ladybugs last year. They did great. Do your research when considering spraying chemicals. Use organics, you know, or plant-derived products. You know, that's the way to go. You know, don't be using pesticides on your, on your cannabis. Who wants to smoke that? So how to maintain a healthy crop. How to maintain your healthy crop. Test your soil beforehand. So at the end of the year, when you're testing your plants, you don't have heavy metals or, you know, at the end of the year, like, I have heavy metals. I got zinc. I got this. I got iron. I, got, I can't do it. I got copper. All right, make sure your workers have good hygiene, wear the proper PE. You know, you have to educate your workers on cross-contamination. If you have some guys at home growing, you know, have a home grow and they have powdery mildew and they get in their car and they come to work, they're bringing that powdery mildew right to the site. So please don't do that. You know, go in, change your clothes, wash your hands. You know, then you, you, in the farm, you got to sanitize all your um, production tools, your equipment constantly. Do that. Don't if you have something somewhere, always clean your tools. Clean your tools. R and D, R and D testing during production can alert you to a potential issue. So, if you see something there, get it tested. See what's going on with your plants. It's important to have good harvest practice. Harvest practices are just important as cultivation practices. The crop should be should be drying slowly for about seven to ten days. Ours are about seven to ten days, and they, they came out beautifully. Your driest place should be dark, with a temperature between. I, I we we did a little fluctuation here from fifty to seventy, and your humidity around fifty to sixty. We did a sixty sixty, and that came out perfect. After like seven to eight days, there was a nice little crack in there. Then we take it to the cure. important, the importance of good harvest practices. Use moisture reader to decide when to start your cure. Properly dry your cannabis. Properly dry cannabis contain 10 to 12% moisture. Remove as much leaf as possible. Use, use, use save your trim and shake and keep collect during harvest. You know, that, that could be used in other products down the road. 
Store your plant material in a cool, dark place that the temperature, the temperature is controlled. Make sure, make sure your containers are airtight, air and light will degrade your product. What are your what are your options when your cannabis fails testing? Even though it can feel devastating when you fail your lab testing, you can you can have an um, an option to remediate this. Many remediation methods like UV or aeration work well, but will affect you know the terpene or it will affect the flower, the quality of the flower. So. You know, use the practices before. Don't try to get to that and say, I have to remediate my flower. Okay. How do I go back? I go back. The back arrow. The back arrow. There we go. Okay. You will most likely need to send your flower to be extracted by a processor who is ready and willing to take it. So if you have aspergillus and stuff like that, that could be remediated out. But does your processor want to take that stuff in? You know, it, it's going to contaminate other things. So you, you're, you're going to have to talk to the processor about that. Flour that fails due to aspergillus can be remediated in extraction. Flour that fails due to heavy metals can be extracted and the heavy metals can be filtered out of the oil. Flour that fails due to pesticides, I really, you know, just don't use don't use pesticides. It's it's not a good way to grow cannabis. Different ways cultivators might work with processors. There's splits out there. You can forego paying, you know, a farmer can go for paying for his products to be extracted or processed by agreeing to give a portion of the um the final product to the processor. You will see splits ranging between 50 to 80% on the processor, depending on what you guys are gonna be doing there. A processor will wanna white label your products. If you want something made in your own name, we could we can make it into your own, into your own products, that's white labeling. You know, or the processor say, all right, I will buy your, your cannabis, it's a good quality, you know? So we're gonna be, we could purchase your product and that's it, and the farmer gets a nice little check. Prices will vary depending on the potency and, and the test analytics. What to expect of cultivators when doing business with processors? You know, R&D testing, you, you, you wanna test your product. You know, you wanna test your, your, when you're out in the field and you're growing it, you, you wanna know what's going on. So, you know, pro, and the processor is gonna wanna know the potency of your flower. You just can't go off the word. So there's a lot of farmers out there. I'm poor, I'm poor. I can't get that tested. Get that tested so the processor will work with you. So processors will want to utilize a third-party tester, a member of their own team, because I would I would want to go out there and get that tested on our own to know that if it, their um, test was legit. If you're taking your own sample, do your best to do an accurate representation of the sample and of the entire lot. You know, just don't grab the biggest bud and, and go get that tested. Grab a few different buds, put that together. Consider testing your terps. A good terp profile um, will make your material more valuable. You know, provide organized strain lists with known information, including the source of the genetics, indica, sativa, dominance, potency, and terpene profiles. And provide pictures of your flower as well. So mine was pretty short and sweet and down to the point. So that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Up, Jim. So we're gonna invite everybody who spoke to come on up and do a little bit of Q and A before we head out to lunch. And then when we're ready to go to lunch, we'll have a few people who can guide folks to the other, you'll be there, right, to do that? Okay. So we'll, we can convene out here and move. So you wanna come on up? Yeah. So, Jim, come on up. Who else? Here we must go. Dr. Bagley, I don't know. No, okay. 
Well, if anyone has any questions, we'll just point it in that direction. <laughs> So you guys can stand. I'll grab another page. Does anyone have any questions? Go for it. Uh, for the workforce initiative. So David, yeah, David, that's for you. Do you guys have or do you plan on working with maybe local, regional, I guess, employment companies? Or so part of the issues from a cultivation standpoint is, um, you know, maybe we may be sized adequately for a farm at a farm level. Um, but it's the augmentation of, of a educated workforce that we might need at various times. Um, indoor cultivation is sometimes very easy to predict on a longer basis. We flower, we bed, and we, we harvest, and it's a rotational uh, by rotation of the year. It's, it's, it's a predictable nature of employment. Outdoor is a feast or famine. Yeah. Um, so having an educated workforce. But not just necessary because we might have to augment for a week, and then the next farmer down the road might have to augment for a week. Right. Um, it's kind of, like I said, kind of a feast of famine. I'm just wondering if, if there's any uh, regional employment agency or whatever that might be trying to fill out his workforce, or do we need to do it organically ourselves and develop, you know, our own kind of group of, of, of educated workers? Uh, so um, thank you, thank you for the question. And you know, um, very specifically, you're you're talking about harvest and trim, and you know, we we are trying to address this issue. There are a uh, the Workforce Development Institute, which is a partner of uh, w, uh, CWI. I'm employed by the Workforce Development Institute. Uh, we are looking at creative ways to work with uh, mobile trim teams, and that can provide uh, a service. You know, come and go, right? That's what you're talking about, and. We we recognize that there is you know with outdoor uh, outdoor farming that there is a need for uh, higher work uh, higher workforce at certain times of the year and and there is a an interest in at least from our end in supporting the mobile trim teams that are starting to sprout up uh, in the state nothing solidified yet but we are working on it hopefully in time for the for the harvest. Uh, and we do work with the Department of Labor very closely, and the Department of Labor has regional offices all over the state, and probably will be involved in in that support. There's a team there; it's the C team, C E E D, uh, and they are they have a, a strong interest in this as well. I mean, we uh, as cultivators or anybody that's probably licensed at this point receives hundreds and thousands of emails, and there are a lot of those trim teams that are from out of state, from what I've noticed. But internal to New York, yeah, I, I haven't seen as many. I guess they're they're coming. Yeah, they've been established. You know, states. Some states have been established, obviously longer than we have. Right. So they've had that time right. uh, to develop those. And I guess I would rather support a local regional business than somebody from Michigan or. Well, it, it has to be because the, the the way that the regulations are uh, curated here in the state, in order to work in the facility, you need to be you need to be employed by that facility, and and so there is a there is the, it, the modeling around that is what's quite complicated because you know are you going to hire you know forty people you know for two weeks or three weeks, and and if so, what does that hiring process look like? Is there a third party? Um, process that can make it easier for you to have these folks as your employees. There's a, a whole uh, process that's being created for that. And then at the same time, there's engagement with OCM to resolve that as well. Whereas where we don't want you necessarily to have to hire all of these employees just for those weeks, maybe you can subcontract to a contractor that has them on payroll and are giving them benefits, maybe to union shop. Um, there are a number of creative uh, ideas that we've that we're entertaining at the moment and trying to support. I would fear that if you're potentially on this potentially on the side of your grill that you might want to call uh, TPI if you're subcontracting. Yes, so that that has to. Um, yeah, well, that's a per, the person's of interest is like who's owning who's owning who's benefiting financially. But yeah, we are. We are. We recognize that. Um, last year, I mean, even our friends, you know, were, had crops hanging, and we're trying to figure out, like, what do I do with this? I and mean, I can't hire, you know, a hundred people right now to do. So there is a lot of interest in trying to resolve this issue, and there's some regulatory aspects, um, that are are kind of impeding that. And so when the regs do drop again, 
um, make sure you know to activate and respond and and su submit your requests and your suggestions around that particular issue because they're going to do another review and then they're going to release them again hopefully in the fall. Go ahead. I thank you all for uh, the information you've given us today. Uh, I recently completed uh, the members compliance and training mentorship program uh, went out by OCM. One of the disappointing bits of news that we got recently is that uh, licensing is again going to be delayed until at least the fall Labor Day, is what they're telling us. Um, you know, the, the argument can be made that an outdoor greenhouse license, uh, specifically an outdoor license issued in the fall in Western New York uh, or in even New York State, is sort of worthless, at least for the in the foreseeable uh, six month future. As outdoor growers, which all of the current licensees are, how do you feel about those of us in a position to get a license at that point, transitioning or starting with indoor as an alternative versus waiting through the winter months to get started outdoor? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I would say, first of all, you're going to get a license to grow outdoor or indoor by the state. Um, we have to choose as well. You'd have to choose. Right. Yeah. I mean, it'd be great if they allow us to grow outdoor and indoor, but I mean, right now we're allowed to grow outdoor or mixed light or a combination of both. Um, they haven't gotten that far yet. Um, I think that, you know, from what I understand in, in, in the fall, they're going to be giving out some other licenses that may incorporate some indoor. So it's kind of like you have to make your choice. I mean, I mean, my my beginning goal, my 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 business plan is really it revolves around an indoor grow, but because I did the hemp, the hemp uh, seed production and seed starts, I was able to get the hemp or the, the 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 outdoor license. So I jumped on that instead of sitting on the sidelines for two years. But my end goal, my end goal still is to be indoors. Um, so really, yeah, you know, you'd have to make a decision at that point in time because you're not going. Obviously, you can't grow outdoors. Uh, and unless you choose an indoor license, if they do release those at this time, you know, you're going to have to, then you have to choose an indoor if that's what you want. You have to look at your end, your end goal. But I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I would like to jump in because I'm the business behind the business. And I think you have to look at the whole picture. I don't know. You know, you have to look at your business plan. You have to look at your finances. You have to look at how much time it's going to take to implement to build an indoor growing facility. It may take you as long as those six months. And at which point you can just get started right. sooner, or well, perhaps more easily or less expensively for the outdoor growth. You know, really have to come down from a very personal level what you're capable of doing. And I don't mean, you know, the grow itself, but literally financially, you know, there's you can bet that it's going to cost a lot more than you anticipate it's going to cost. Yeah. You can bet. <laughs> That the state is going to continue to delay this, and so they may not open applications okay. in the fall. You know, they may not until the end of the year. So the best laid plan, right, of my men and women, um, is just to to just figure out what you want because you're in for the long game, right? And so what you're what you're capable of, what you have available, what your resources are, and then build a plan around that, and then apply appropriately. That would be my advice from a business perspective. Because cultivators right now have run out of money. You know, I represent a cultivation community through Kenny, and not a single one that I've encountered of the people that we represent um, are financially, you know, doing well. At this well it's, it's, hard, it's hard to turn a profit when you don't when, have right, you don't have outlets. But if you have more months to prepare, right? You know, because I mean, the harvest right. comes yeah. down at, in the fall. The winter is your best friend. You know, you can prepare, do your finances, also start your mothers. You know, you can build a room to start your mothers. You know, there's a lot you can do in the winter time to prepare for this huge endeavor. Um, I, I agree with with both of you and probably what you're about to say, but like, you know, take the some take the winter. It's our best friend. Yeah. It's a lot of paperwork involved. Yeah. And what Jeanette said too is we're gonna hear a lot about compliance this afternoon. I come from the healthcare industry. I wear a compliance hat all the time. Right. And so you had suggested work on your SOPs, you know, get all of the compliance pieces uh, dialed in because that those are the things that are going to not only, only enable you to get a license, but also maintain compliance over the long term. So thank you. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, 
Jim Gibson has good advice on how to feel the product is for both of us. What advice do you give the cultivators to choose the process? What are red flags? What are things they should be looking for when it comes to the process? Process, a process, you're going to over process, uh, like over promise something, you know, you say, I'll take your cannabis and I'll pay you down the road. You can work something out. You know, some of these farmers have no money. So I, I'm thinking it's like, we got to work out a nice deal, you know, is that to figure something out THC wise for these farmers. It, I don't know. It's, it's, I mean, I, I would suggest yeah. doing your research. Research, it's exciting. See what they're doing. I mean, that's, that's pretty typical. Like, uh, hay or alfalfa is, is a, a protein based uh, payment or reimbursement based on percentage points of protein. So yeah. I imagine at some point there will be a THC based um, payment system for more cannabis, right? Yeah, that'd be, that'd be nice. You know, what, it's just, what that is. Even in being a processor, do we have money? You know, we got to figure it out. Can we work together to make money together? You know, but the problem is that we have so few retail dispensaries that processors don't even place to go to. So no place to go. Firms are built on the back that they don't get paid either. So that's what it is. Hopefully, the marketplace does come out where THC percentage, quality, whatever it might be, the aspects you're talking about will become that. It's never going to be a regulated piece. It'll be a built-in marketplace economics. Thing. That's it. But you know, right now, you know, we look at this whole supply chain. But what else is going to happen to that supply chain with crop? I mean, let's say you do make concentrate. Well, everyone's crops get rolled now. Everyone make concentrate now. Those concentrates go down. To me, a lot of the root cause of the problem still comes to place of you got no one to sell to. Yeah, and it's fine giving your stuff as a cultivator to. Processor, but there's they, no stores, there's no dispensaries, they're all uh, illegal smoke shops, they're already making all the money. So, one of the, one of the things that we did is add Miranda's, but I don't know what you meant, but do your research. We called you know everybody and then went on a road trip and actually visited the facility, you know, to see what they're doing. And the, and the other piece of it also for us was just matching visa, you know, so like who's of like mind and sort of quality and uh, you know, who are the people we want to work with? Because again, this is a long game, right? It's, it's not just about who's going to get it out there quickly. I mean, there's a piece that asks everyone has money, but it's also like who we want to partner with for the long term. I mean, that's that's how we approach it. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to um, sit, do your research, you know, call people. Mm -hmm. That's how we handle this. Any, anyone else? Uh, Sorry, I just want to push back on the uh, Yeah, definitely. Like, we did uh, test the bio track because it's their laboratory, and we got the whole floor, and uh, we kind of did that with all the testing labs. We're smaller cell centers, so speaking to just our choice of testing or even uh, the cultivators that we showed, we went out and took them. And I mean, people in the industry love to show off the stuff, so everyone's going to be happy to, and it'll really let you see, like, hands on what's going to happen here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just a question about seeds in the, in the vegetable world or in the dairy world, you can eat catalogs. And I really haven't seen a, or know where to go to find quality seeds out of the animals. Give me five years. <laughs> <laughs> Research. I'm yeah. Online. And yeah. There, there are a lot of seed banks that have been around for decades. Um, I, 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 there are some rules and regulations around how to acquire seeds. Um, and and various strains, so you also have to be familiar with that as well. I'm trying to remember the breeders who are great. The, the key, you know, seed banks are great, but finding a breeder that produces quality, you know, seeds that you, you know, especially finding something that you're looking for in this area, regional, like that. Yeah, like regional is going to be important. Like uh, seeds? Not at this point, no, because I really haven't been able to. I didn't have the facility to be able to do that on a, you know. A compliant level. Yeah, but we will be. Yeah. 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 Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah. David said to be able to sell them for the Under nurse, under the nurse, not at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Because even right now, yeah. you can sell that. Yeah. 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 And actually, David said, due to David's organization, we're actually we're funded to uh, uh, start a tissue culture lab. Okay. <laughs> You know, so that's going to be for that's going to be twofold. That's going to be uh, for one that was largely for me. The the impetus was for internal, you know, cleaning up my, my genetics. And you don't have to keep as many mothers around. I mean, if you have a large facility, 
you know, I mean, yeah, it's kind of tough to keep 100, 100 mothers together if you want to have various strains, you know, with tissue culture, you can have a lot less mothers to pull your, your uh, germplasm from. Um, but again, that's all, that's going to take time. And, you know, it's a, it's a new market, it's a new industry in the state. But that, I mean, that's why our name has genetics in it, right? Energy genetics. And that's really where I started was with the genetics of it. And the flower just is, for me, it drives the, the fact that giving, being, uh, being able to be, uh, allowing me to be able to work on the genetics with, because there's no ROI in doing genetics for at least, if you do it right for three to five years. Yeah. You got to stabilize the genetic yeah. in the region. A lot of that's why I was asking you for a song. You don't want to do the hard thing. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that's exactly, that's exactly right. Yeah. Or is there, is there a place where you can uh, read published research on, on the genetics and what, what grows well in New York City? Very little research, you know, generally speaking, because it's been federally you know, prohibited. And so even universities wouldn't touch the, the cannabis side of genetics or, or science because of that. So like you might find some with Cornell, they're going to have a lot of uh, hemp research, uh, the ag extension, and there's going to be uh, information on genetics. But when it comes down to the cannabis plant, uh, because of prohibition, it's just all been, you know, blocked and and, pre and prohibited. So really, it's a word of mouth networking, um, meet the other farmers in the industry that are here regionally, even um, in, you know, Massachusetts and uh, you know, New Jersey, like this region in general, um, you might want to expand your, your research to uh, breeders that are, that are breeding in the region, because th these plants are going to be acclimated to this region. But Ontario too, because cannabis seeds is now off special. One of those can be mailed from Canada, right? Well, so well, not Canada, but for the other states. We we don't rec we, we don't recommend um, uh, interstate um, or anything. Uh, but what we do, what, what you might want to do is what, what I believe. We, we look at the latitude where the, where the strains were developed, you know, and, yeah. and and the regions too. Like what your what is your altitude? What is the latitude? Because um, there could be certain things like okay, so I'm at fifteen hundred. Uh, feet above sea level, you know, if I get something out of Afghanistan, I'm at 42, uh, large at 42. After all the stuff out of Afghanistan is at 37, but if I'm at a, a, a very a higher elevation, so, I mean, it, it's kind of a calculation you have to play with, and it's trial and error, you know, but they're the things you want to look at. You know, like I had run some stuff out of Hawaii, um, which people say, well, Hawaii, that's nothing like our environment, but Hawaii gets pounded with a lot of rain, you know, so, and, and the plants that I had no problems with whatsoever, just to follow up on what I talked about, was my land race genetics I had in the field. Stuff I got, uh, because my seeds came out of Oregon, which is kind of a similar environment to what we had. A lot of moisture. It's a little bit warmer, a little bit longer, but still a lot of the same type of region. Um, and I, I still got pounded genetically on this stuff. I wasn't really happy with it at all. Uh, had problems, but we did overcome all our problems, which, but it, it was a lot of headaches and nightmare. But my, any of my land race stuff, my Hawaiian land race, uh, stuff that we had Colombian, Highland Colombian genetics in it. Um, my, my the low blend of the low, uh, uh, low Vida, which is the Mexican haze strain. I had no issues at all with those genetics, which just piggytails off of what I was talking about earlier that the old school land race genetics are much more resilient to any type of pathogens and insects as all these new genetics. The, the new genetics are just a lot weaker because so, they've been hybridized so much. But anyway, they're the kind of things you want to look at is the region and it's a calculation. Like I say, you know, even though Afghanistan is lower, they, they're largely at a higher elevation. So kind of it changes that environment, you know, as well. So it, it's really kind of trial and error at the point, but there are a couple of points you can you kind of look at and, and, and work off of. And, and some farmers are adjusting their expectations. They're saying, you know, I'm probably not going to profit this year, but I'm going to work on these genetics, acclimate them to my environment, to my soil. And maybe that's part of your plan is to work with genetics for the first few years to acclimate them to your soil, to your environment. And before you go into huge mass production. And also I'll tell you, there's a couple of times that you have to run something a couple of times sometimes before you really get down to what it's going to produce for you. Like my little Buena Vida, when I first got to start working with that, the, the, the trichome production off that is off the hook compared to what it was just a year ago, just for me continually working with it and growing in the same environment all the time. Yeah, the difference too of growing in pots or growing in the ground. Grow in pots and in the ground. The ones in the ground is beautiful. And all the ones in the pot, and they didn't do so well. You know, we're, we're in zone five, actually, in our area. You know, most of New York's zone four. We're lucky to be like outraged in zone five. It's a little warm. 
So we're going to take one more question and then we'll move out to for lunch and you guys will have access to these folks at lunch if you want to pop them there. I had one question just for the guys. Anybody else can help you? So for your seven foot, I can I can Canada first. So like um like the you know our neighboring more, but they can't recommend getting seeds from there. But um also if you're picking out seeds from say a foreign seed bank and you know it's a good seed bank, but you don't know what plants you want, don't look at names. I didn't pick out names when I picked I looked at the description. And so I do I read my description and I'm like pest resistant, you know, frost resistant, whatever. I look for like the qualities of that plant and then I name the list of those and then I highlight it, right? And then I'm like weeks and I highlight this and I have all these different highlights and then I put it together and at the end I had the plant the seeds I wanted and some of those names were like names that people are like, those are great names. And I was like, I don't care, but that's awesome for sales later. But like will the plant turn out well? And most of my plants, like I have very few people, things turned out really well. Um for being how it was. Like we didn't have much powdery mildew, we treated it right away. We didn't have much um botrytis and stuff like that. We got rid of the pests right away, you know, like uh that frost, it took like five or six hard frosts before I was like air was some frost damage. Um we still got everything out of the field before it snowed and I still have good stuff. Wow, um, some of those things, most of those things is you know don't have quality environment. But qualities. So like see you're looking for those qualities, not those names. Right. Because those qualities are what you want. And then the names are made plus like everybody changing the names okay. I just say it really quick too call if you could get to the seed producers, it's not always the easiest thing. But call the people who grew the seeds. They'll tell you, they'll be honest with you because they want you to succeed. They'll say, no, this strain's not good for you. This strain will work for you. This is how this, you know, and, and so that that's one thing. It's work. It, it is, it's work. There's, there's no silver bullet for this. You've got to dig into it and, and do the research. A lot of them are growing indoors too. So I, yeah, no yeah, a lot of them are growing in greenhouses too. You know, it's, you bring them outdoors, you're like, that's and, good. And, and, good and good point. Yeah. It changes everything. Um, so. All right, one quick question. So I just, it might be better, but I wonder if it's bad for re-ask the same question I was asking, Chris, like kind of got pigeonholed into delivery, mobile delivery, and it's like the same. Um, a quick comment, there is uh, a nonprofit being involved in Western New York, the better it's to trim. Um, that, 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 that is drawn out right now. What is it called? Cut, cut, Nice. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. But his question raises the argument: Are you going to work with other employment agencies or to broaden it for the new or New York State thinking? Are you thinking about general education for a workforce for this whole list of jobs that you got out there? Um, because you know, there are jobs in New York State that will be mandated, employee in charge, for example, right? It's a completely compliance based. Um, and there are going to be a lot of people looking for that job, people looking for trim jobs, people looking for packaging jobs, people looking for blood bank jobs. Um, there is no trained labor staff, except that everyone is moving back from the West Coast right now. Uh, so what is New York State going to do? What are you guys going to do uh, thinking of uh, to develop these types of programs and then higher level certification employee in charge? Uh, anyone here with a card license would like to see a piece of paper that says this team knows the shit. Mm -hmm. Right. So I appreciate the question. So uh, last year, the state created an appropriation and uh, for uh, statewide free education, and that's what we do. Today, we've already engaged over 15,000 New Yorkers and have been probably involved in 70 uh, plus events uh, just since uh, last summer. And so we're not slowing down. Um, after this, I'll be in Rochester and then Syracuse, and we're also hiring. And so, you know, we're, we'll have trainers all across the state to help uh, help the, the communities catch up. Um, so that's what CWI is doing, and, and that's by way of uh, state initiative. And, you know, I know that the C team at the DOL uh, has also been conducting a lot of training, and we're actually um, collaborating on training to all of the employment centers across the state. There's, I think, about 90 of them um, from, you know, in every major city and some of the small municipalities. Um, in New York City, for instance, I think there's like eight or nine in just New York City alone employment centers. And so training the staff at the employment centers to help direct folks to uh, to either our training or to a supplemental training. Uh, also very important is going to be the SUNY and CUNY uh, systems, you know, the, the state schools 
are going to be playing a major role in, in educating the community. And so there is a little bit of a disconnect with federal funding and grants and spot and scholarships and, and so on. So there, there are local um, local movements to kind of address that uh, companies um, committing certain amounts of their profits to create scholarship funds and grant initiatives. Uh, there was a grant that came from the state to uh, to different colleges that have kind of teamed up. Uh, some of those colleges are using that money to provide uh, grants and scholarships for the students to take their classes. Also, uh, we we also there is a recognition that not every, not all, every plant is grown the same way. Every you know every cultivator has their own unique way of approaching cultivation, same as manufacturing and even not to an extent retail. So we do also work to hopefully train um, to make sure that the that the employers are training their staff, right? And so there is a um, there is a mandate for vendor response uh, responsible vendor training um, that is supposed to be provided by the employers uh, free of charge. Um, we are um, hesitant about you know requiring cert certifications or training as a requirement for the workplace because it could present the barrier particularly the communities that have been most impacted, black and brown people. Um, we don't want to, you know, say, oh, you have to, you know, spend $3,000 or whatever to get a certificate so you can get a job. Um, that would be a counter, you know, counter mission, right? And so um, there are a number of, of tactics that we're deploying to try to get as much information as possible to the community. Uh, and we're going to continue this summer. Uh, we're, we're uh, at CWI, we're doing a deep dive into craft cultivation and what the workspace, uh, what the worker environment looks like in a craft cultivation environment. Uh, and so we know that there's a lot of information about commercial production, commercial cultivation, and what those jobs look like. Not much happening in terms of what's happening at the craft at the craft level. And so we are um, we are doing a, a study, and we'll be producing materials and exhibits and presenting them across the state and infusing them into all of our trainings. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, everybody. So. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Terpology course. Really happy to do this class. This is one of my favorite classes to do because it's a little bit more interactive and we get to practice some cool, uh, some cool stuff. So before we jump into the Terps, uh, I'd like to kind of set some premise of why we're doing this. Uh, so terpenes are super important. Um, we're learning now that terpenes are actually driving these pandemics. And, you know, back in the day, you know, it's all about THC, right? Everybody's like, I got high THC. And that's really great, but it's not really telling the whole story. Why do people affect, have different effects or feel or, or, or to have different sensations when they consume one product over another? If, you know, THC is the same as here, as it's the same as here, but there's something different. There's something going on here, right? You know, what's the difference? And what it turns out, is that the aromatics of the plant, the terpenes, are really the difference, and and this is what we um, what we are now calling terpology. And so this terpology course was developed by Dr. Ethan Russo, who is a luminary in the cannabis industry, really is, is leading the way in development of, of terpene profiles, and doing terpene research to figure out what are the various effects that people can um, can get from terpenes. Um, also. This is, um, you know, something that, you know, very similar to a sommelier, somebody who would characterize cannabis, oh, sorry, okay, can, uh, characterize wine. They would characterize wine based on the various aromatic profiles, the flavor profile, and they would be able to tell you when and where that, that wine was grown. And that has directly, that has, it's directly due to the terroir of that wine. And the terroir is going to be uh, based on the environmental conditions that that wine was grown in and the, the soil. And did it rain too much or did it not rain enough? And because of all of that, every year wine has a different flavor profile, different scent profile. And, and now with cannabis, we're, we, it's the same, right? So when we grow weed outdoors this year, and the environmental impacts, uh, you know, they bring more or less than it did last year, that cannabis, that profile, that chemical expression of the plant will be quite different year over year over year. And when it translates to like, what does it mean to the worker? Well, if the worker can characterize, can take a sniff of that product, you know, at the retail level, even procurement, 
right? And if you're in processing and you're going to go and you're going to buy, a, you're going to invest a lot of money into a specific crop in that year, you want to know that it's the best crop for your process. And you're going to do a couple of things. You can look at a COA, a certificate of analysis, which will tell you exactly how much, how much cannabinoids in the terpenes, is it they clean, does it have metals, um, mycotoxins, so on and so forth. That's the first thing you're going to do. The second thing you might do is actually inspect the plant, right? You're going to look at it, you know, pass the basic uh, examination from the lab. Now let's inspect the plant. We're going to look at it. We're going to determine if that plant is clean, does it have any kind of the trim really done well? Uh, what does it smell like? There are a couple of different ways of smelling um, the plant. There is a, an ambient uh, aromatic expression. So when you first open that jar and that smell hits you in the face, and that's that's been ambient, right? So it's sitting there, it's kind of uh, it's there, and now it's like an explosion of aromatics. You smell it. Great. But is that telling the whole story? Maybe not, because it was in a contained environment, right? It was closed. And now you're opening that jar. If I take that nug out and I look at it and I smell it, I'm going to take it, I can take it up to my nose. I can pinch that a little bit. The second way is smell the canvas. Pinch that a little bit, and you're going to get an initial aromatic profile from that plant. You can tell if it's cured well or if it hasn't been cured very well, depending on if it feels sticky in your fingers or if the, if the scent just kind of dissipates very quickly. You know, if it dissipates very quickly, it's probably not the best cure. Now, the third way of smelling cannabis is to break it open. And you're going to break it open and it's going to burst those trifles and you're going to put it up against your nose and take a big whiff of it. Now you're going to get a direct in inhalation. Uh, the, the aromatic properties are going to hit the olfactory gland, which is right above in the nasal area. It's going to your brain, which is the same place that we also store our memories. It's a really cool thing because when we, as human beings, when we stay away from things that are dangerous, we use our eyes, we use our ears, we also smell it. You can smell rotten food and you remember what rotten food smells like, right? And so the same thing with, with, uh, with analyzing terpenes. Everybody should have a little manual in front of you with the terpology course. In that manual, we're going to flip uh, to uh, the terpene uh, known as, we're going to start with lemonine. And I'm gonna pass around this cup and there's these little little papers in it. And you're gonna take this. I wanna also do an allergy alert here. So if you have allergies generally to seasonal plants or to nuts or to strong uh, aromatic, aromatics, um, be very mindful. Don't put it up in your nose. Generally what I ask people to do is take it up, you know, take a whip and then kind of, you know, bring it out. Uh, and, and if you start to notice that you're getting congested, stop smelling immediately. It may be that you're having an allergy. And so we're going to pass around uh, lemony. Now, lemony uh, is found in, in a lot of plants, not just uh, cannabis, found in lemons and oranges and some citrus fruits. And lemony uh, generally is going to be found in plants around the equatorial region. So wherever there's going to be tropical weather, you're going to find some lemony. And uh, lemonine has its own uh, distinct characteristics. If, you, if, you, if you're on page 22, um, you're going to notice that every page of, the, of, the, of, of our terpene is going to have a breakout. You're going to have the molecule over here on the, on the right side of the page. How to pronounce it. Some of these are a little tricky to pronounce. It's going to have a flash point and a boiling point. Uh, boiling. Uh, point is, you know, the temperature at which something will start boiling. The flash point is when that, uh, when, when that has evaporated, uh, that vapor, the point of which it would uh, flash or combust. Then, then you have the, so, and then on the right side of the page, you have aromatic profile, plant sources, and potential effects. And note that um, this, again, this is a study that's been done by uh, Dr. Ethan Russo. We don't uh, necessarily, we're not doctors, we don't, um, we don't know this, uh, we, we haven't done this research, so we rely heavily on experts in the industry to convey this information. So, uh, you plant sources, you can find this in grapefruit, lime, lemons, oranges, uh, potential effects, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, uh, possible cancer fighting and disease uh, preventing qualities are still currently under investigation. 
Now, the part where uh, the sommelier may be interested in, in this whole thing is the aromatic profile. How do you describe that aromatic profile? And so you can see that there's a lot of nice words there. And you now I'll kind of describe it. So if, if I was a butt tender and somebody was coming in and you know, and I had a plant that was very lemony, I might say, oh, this has lemony in it. And it, you know, this is a citrus forward flavor profile, uplifting mood effects, well-developed sweet and sour notes reveal a spectrum of organic citrus fruit aromas, capturing hints of everything from fresh squeezed juices to oil of the vine. <laughs> Strains would uh, be prominent, uh, strains are prominent, uh, Mendocino perp, white, uh, and super lemon haze. So now, if I'm smelling this, if you smell this, all of a sudden, you, you remember the smell, you're like, oh, that's lemon. Now you know that there's anti-inflammatory, anti antioxidant effects. You can convey that to the client, the customer. Uh, you can talk about... Um, those various, uh, those those very uh, various uh, smell uh, where where the plant would be found in nature or otherwise. Now that was an easy one. You know, everybody kind of knows the, uh, you know, the lemon smell. I'm gonna pass around one, and I'm and let me see. Which one am I gonna pass around? See if uh, if you if anybody can ID it without me saying what it is. So, and if you do, I have a cool CWI hat for you somewhere. The first person to come up with it. I know a lot of people might come up with it. So we'll see what happens. No, I excluded. No, was that? Excluded. You're excluded. <laughs> you might know what it is immediately. This one is one of my favorite terpenes. It reminds me of my aunt's art studio growing up when I used to spend my summers in her proper in her in her house. Um, yeah, we're going to pass it around um, and let's see if anybody can tell me what this is. We got when I when raised hands went up earlier, I saw probably like 80% of you are in this industry already dealing with this plant. So let's see. All right, I'll say when, okay, when, when, and then whoever raises their hand first uh, will. I don't know. We're not going to cheat now. Let's everybody get to the get a seat here. And I, and I also see some some folks looking at the flavor wheel. I can't believe I haven't even talked about that yet. What is that? We'll talk about it after, right out, right? We'll talk about it next. But the flavor wheel is pretty important. It's a tool to help us communicate. You're like, you might. What's that? Thanksgiving. Oh, so that's really important. You just said you're, you're, you triggered a memory. And that's how smells are supposed to work. For me, all of these smells trigger a memory. And it will for you too. Oh, I heard clover. You're getting close. Does everybody have a sample yet? Lots of, I hear lots of people getting here and there. Can I Everybody has a sample. Now, please, if you think you know what it is, raise your hand. Oh, we got a lot of hand raised. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start from the front. So, you Gino? No. Oh, hands went down. <laughs> 
No. Beta carry on. Who else, who else thought of beta carry on? I thought I heard it from back there. And the gentleman right here. Yeah, let's talk about what it smells like. What did you get? It kind of smells like it's got that. That's right. And if you go to beta caryophylline in your books and look at the origin of beta caryophylline, one of the main origins is pepper, black pepper. And it's really cool that you can pick that out. Good job. I owe you a hat. So let's talk about beta caryophylline. The sommelier would say it like this, beta caryophylline involves the inside of a spice cabinet. <laughs> mix spice and each word with a subtle savory sweetness. Strong notes of milk peppercorns open to warm, comforting suggestions of cinnamon and incense. See, uh, see, uh, shades of roasted nuts and ginger add to the terpenes inviting aroma. And so imagine you're going into a dispensary one day and you have somebody there with a you know a nice curly mustache, you know, it's just like you know, like being really poetic and describing what's so different about that, so different because back in the day when this was prohibited, we had seconds, minutes, you know, it was either you know, it's the key bird that's gonna get the hell off my block, you know, I got things to get right. But it's no longer like that anymore. We can sophisticate this plan. We can, uh, you know, make the experience better in in the in the transaction, creating an experience. And what's also really um, what's also really important is that the the bud tender is representing that grower who is doing who is really undertaking that laborious effort. That grower can't be in every single retail space or in every single dispensary, right? And so who's going to tell that story about the, about the growers, you know, efforts and trials and tribulations and, and look, you know, to the, the soil, they created this aromatic expression that's really unique to this year, you better get on this right now. You know, this is, this is what we're talking about when we're building a workforce and we're making it credible and it's going to be a sophisticated workforce and we get to talk about wheat the way that we want to because we love it. You know, this is part of the process, understanding these terpenes and being able to characterize them and share them. All right, let's get into the next one. Should we do the same thing? Do a little test? What do you guys think? Yeah. Want to give it another shot? All right, we'll give it another shot. <laughs> so what we can do is I can split these up into yes. a couple of cups to make it a little easier. That's fine here. Just, uh, yeah, I'll take one more, one more, one more volunteer, please. Thank you. <laughs> no more hats. I'm pretty sure I only have one left. I have no hats. Oh no, beta cardiac. You can't look at this. No, I'm, not saying, I'm not guessing. You're not guessing. That's what we're doing. No, okay. okay. A little bit there. A little bit there. A little bit there. And I got to leave some for the scientists here who want to geek out with these turpies later in their machines. Oh, good. And then. Thank you. This is my second favorite turkey. This one will make your nose tingle. It always makes my nose tingle. Uh, I think we're good now. Yeah.
Right. So I have I have somebody up here in the front that said that she thinks she knows what it is. This is mango. Mango, yes. Mercy. Yeah. Congratulations. You don't get a half, but you got it right. <laughs> you get a round of applause. Huh? Oh, nice. It's got a mango. Uh, who, who who here picked up Mercy? We got another one, Matt. This guy, he's the sommelier, and folks, he's got things to do. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> so let's talk about Mercy. Let's talk back about Mercy. It's an additive in fruit. Uh, in fruit loops and fruit health. Whoa. That's really good information because those are like two of my favorites. They don't play like one my two year old that we go to So let's talk about Mercy. Everybody on the Mercy page? Check out that compound. How cool does that look? So Mercy is, is found in, in lemongrass tea, um, or I should say lemongrass, basil. Uh, basil leaves and mangoes. Um, and again, there is a whole way to describe it from an aromatic profile. I'm not going to say my sommelier voice right now, but you can practice later. Um, Mercy um, has, excuse me, pharmacy research on antioxidants and antimicrobial effects are ongoing. Did it uh, remind anybody uh, any of anything else other than than uh, the mangoes? Did anybody pick up something unique or a memory, a time in your life that you may have smelled this? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, all good. What's that? Okay. Oh, are you are you still with Beta Caryophylline? Yeah. 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 <laughs> And to you know the way that I remember beta caryophylline, I think of beta, we have to be right, carry, like the lady carry off a lean. Like they got into a rumble, you're like, carry, get off a lean. And it's an easy way to remember that. Carry off a lean. All right. Let's see what is next. So David, are you gonna start a sommelier class? Uh, maybe, maybe this is the start of it. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Right, there you go. I just thought it was fitting that you brought the red solo cups to college. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. That was uh ping pong, beer pong, whatever. That's funny. All right. I was gonna say quarters, but yeah, that's old school. Uh, we did plenty of that too. <laughs> well no, it's the same, but so, now, I don't think I do now they do the this next terpene is really cool. It's pretty easy. You might be able to get it pretty quickly. Do you have another cup of it? Or yes. Sure. So. so another, another, another story. True story. When I was about uh, ten or eleven years old, I was diagnosed with asthma. And I was on an inhaler, uh, ibuterol, for the majority of my life. Um, I was I served in the military, so I couldn't consume cannabis. And then about three years after my service, I had uh, three years of consuming consistently, my asthma went away completely. And then my mother, who is a lot older than me, who also had lifelong asthma, who's been hospitalized multiple times for it, currently has no asthma. Well, there is a, a particular terpene in the cannabis plant in the world, the terpene that acts as a bronchial dilator. So that's a hint. Oh, uh, I got a what? What do you got? 
No, man, I'm going to wait. Are you going to wait? No, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll wait. But you know what it is already? Yeah. All right. He could smell it from across the room. Oh my gosh. Yo, is anybody hiring a sommelier? Because that guy right there. Yeah, what is it? Yeah. Yeah. Alpha piney. Alpha Let's give her applause. We're creating an alpha time. Sound in training. And what is it? It's so yeah. And true story, alpha pining is a bronchial dilator. And if you have asthma, and then it's so counterintuitive, right? That you would smoke something and your asthma would go away, but it's here. That's my experience. And I don't know if anybody can debate it. My doctors aren't prescribing me without a butyrol anymore, so they know it's true. <laughs> So, alpha pinene is found naturally occurring in numerous plants, including cannabis, conifer trees, pine needles, herbs like dill, rosemary, and sage. It has it shows promises for chronic pain management due to the anti-inflammatory effects, and research research is ongoing into the potential of being a bronchial dilator. So, like the bronchial so the lungs it's opening them up, and some magic is happening. Telling you people, this is a this this terpene right here is uh very under uh, under uh underutilized in the industry. You don't really get it in a lot of the strains, um, but it should be um people should be paying more attention to this strain. Um, but it is in Blue Dream. OG Kush are known for their high uh uh alpha pining. How much time? How are we doing on time? Ten more minutes. Okay. Well, we'll do, I think, one or two more. All right. This is what it feels like to you every time that I pop samples open. Yeah. <laughs> you get the first whip. That, yeah. Right. You should see when I open the truck after driving for two and a half hours, you know, on a yeah. warm day. What it smells like every time I <laughs> come upstairs, like, where we have the lock room with their, oh, everyone's stuff. Then you walk in and you're like, no. and there you just get everything. And you have all the artificial flavors too. Oh, yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Thanks, sir. All right, this one has a close around maybe my view something that may be in your household uh, cleaning closet or. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna do a, a, a we're gonna practice something here. So this is the flavor wheel. Based on smelling what you're about to smell, I want to see if somebody here can give me three ways to describe this smell using this flavor wheel. Okay, that's one. Gotta be three. Yes. The whole point of the flavor wheel is to give us more words to use so that we could be fancier with our, our delivery of characterizing the chemical expression of this plant. So give me three words from that flavor wheel. Herbaceous. And yeah, that's the practice. You have to give me three words. I think uh herbaceous. Earthy and woody. Herbaceous, earthy, and woody. I can see that about this particular turkey, sir. I would say uh, solvent based on the acetone and the uh, paint. Spot on. <laughs> Spot on. That's how I would describe it. No offense, but that's how exactly I would describe it. Good job. That's why I'm talking to you. You guys all agree. I can I can assume that you all agree with him, right? Because you're all. Oh man, I have to find a hat. I might give you my own hat. Oh my goodness! Yeah, you better stop that. <laughs> oh my goodness! So this is terpenoline. Terpenoline. 
Kapin Oli. And Kapin Oli, uh, let's go to page 24. And again, what's really cool about this manual is that it gives you the phonetic pronunciation of the word because some of these are like hard and I have to like, what am I saying? Kapin Oli. Not bad. Um, I have help. So, plant sources, this is coming from trees, especially fir, pine, tea trees, uh, can also be found in spices like human nutmeg, fruits like apple and flowery plants like lilac. Uh, this has, uh, you know, antibacterial effect and it's been demonstrated to have antioxidant properties, um, which are beneficial for heart health and show promise of fighting cancer cells in the brains of rats. Now, this terpinoline has also been found in strains such as Jack Herrera, who's uh, passed away some years ago, and uh, last week was, uh, you know, his, uh, his anniversary of his passing. Uh, super lemon haze. Uh, so terpinoline, for me, when I smell this, I think of roach spray. Yeah. Right? You guys got that? Like, I don't know if anybody ever lived in public housing in the city. I have. And first Saturday of the month, they're coming, they're pumping that thing and they're spraying everything. And this is what it smelled like growing up as a kid. So every time I smell terpinoline, I'm like, oh, I know that smell. And then I can immediately associate that smell with the potential effects. That's how this works. All right. Last one. Uh, I think I only have one more cup. Okay. So we're going to just put it all in one cup and pass this around. And I'll just leave that to the side. Well, I was say, I could just take the papers out. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Then let me just put them all in. There you go. Sweet. That's a good idea. Cool. It's a good thing I'm not allergic to any of these because right? I'm constantly. Oh, quick, huh? Yeah, right. You want to take some of those? Yeah. Thank it's you, like Bill. It's like going to mass. <laughs> I just think the same thing. Oh my goodness! No, we're not Catholics. <laughs> All right. Well, let's all right using the flavor wheel sommelier yeah you're helping us all you're taking us to the land what is what do you smell here you get, you get hungry, so it's throwing off your senses. A uh, volunteer, do you want to read three? I smell like some menthol. Okay, yes. It's got a lot of menthol. Okay, menthol. What do we got? I need three from you got three. And he's the whole thing. And how do we characterize this? Yeah, be from in to out. All right, the sommelier wants to speak. Sir, I'm going to say that it starts off between the fungus and the patients. Yeah, it's nowhere in there. I'm trying to pick that out. But I will go for. Okay, let's we'll stay on the basic side and roll it probably around behind the exit area. I'm going to say so no tiny band. Are you getting like a little piney from it? Yeah, it's 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 Okay. Did you do you think you might know which one it is? No. <laughs> Sir in the front. Yes, you could lift them. And you thought of it as a kind of pause. Yeah. Even if you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not. This man, I might have an extra one. I don't know. Let's see. 
So also, eucalyptus are potent uh, bronchial dilators. Here's another one. This reminds me of Vicks. Yeah. And then everybody smells Vicks. My mom used to like lather me on that. And every time I smell this, I think about being sick and having all that Vicks just lathered on. Because I triggered that memory. Now I know, oh, I'm dealing with a bronchial dilator. Right, so this is how the memory, this is how smell and memory works. We can uh, we can correlate that smell to the specific effect. So we're on page thirty three, and and look at that molecule. It's a pretty pretty interesting molecule. It looks like a little human being. Um, I won't be sure the rest. But I put that on here. Oh, dilator, and let's do here's it. Anti-inflammatory agent, lending to its decongestant and also has potential for antibacterial properties, which contribute to its value as a mouthwash additive. Can also be found in Super Silver Haze, uh, Girl Scout cookies, and Bubble Kush. And so I think that the, so we're going to, you know, no more terpenes for now because we've loaded up and some people are getting hungry. Um, that might happen. Um, but I, I want to kind of get some feedback from, from you guys. What did you think about um, this process? Your first time? Um, do, you, do you have any distinct memories that it triggered? Uh, do you see how this can be used in, in the industry as uh, for procurement and for sales? Talk? Sir? <coughs> So I, I think uh, this is a great new development to serve these signals in general. Uh, I think spreading the awareness, I mean, this thing is an interesting effect that the molecules have. Um, and how that affects our perceived effects as we adjust canvas is extremely important for the industry to focus on. Um, so I, I, I can't find the data in doing this course. Or I, I hope that at some point we can expand that and go a little bit deeper into the contract effect and synergy that these compounds have had specifically in uh, the world. I appreciate that. Thank you for saying that. And we do take this to another level. There are, I do have some terpenes in there, Professor, that are are combined. So you'll see OG Christian there. And so that's going to be a combination of terps. Um, it's, it's important just to get like started, right, to kind of figure our way around this plant and identify the terpenes individually before we start diving into the, the poly compounds. But I, that will be part two. And so hopefully the next time I'm invited to Buffalo, if you guys invite me back, I'll come back. I'll bring some, um, some polytherpenes uh, uh, mixtures. Uh, but thank you so much for taking this course. I really appreciate all of you. I hope you enjoy the rest of the, the day in the program and, and good luck with your careers and your endeavors. And feel free to uh, take a card out front, um, Cannabis Workforce Initiative. We're doing courses and classes both online and in person in the community and always looking for opportunities to teach and share whatever we can learn. And we also are learning too. So if you're learning something and you want to share it with us because you think it's important, feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm like, I want to learn as much as I can about this so that I, I can keep on sharing. Please feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, we're going to grab some of David's cards. So if he has to run and break down, we'll have them here available for anyone like that. Uh, so I also, I failed to mention, happy Earth Day, right? Earth Day, let's all stay alive, the land, the earth, and all that. And, and, and especially in the cannabis industry, which consumes a lot of energy, let us all be environmentally conscientious, right? So we're about to segue into a more sobering number of topics on the compliance side. So we're all feeling energized and excited to launch into some of the important things that we need to know as we're all navigating this light picture in this uh, nascent industry in the state. So our next speaker, our presenter, is William Bill Hill from Biofax Labs. He's going to help us, he's going to demystify these lab requirements, especially for those of us who are cultivators who need to get our product uh, tested and for, the, for everybody in the supply chain, it's become super important. 
So Bill, I'm bringing it up to you. <laughs> So, oh. Bill, thank you for the insurance. Um, if anyone has come in um, and didn't sign the finance sheet, it's going to be right up here on the front of the table. I think you can do that at some point. That would be awesome. Is that any presenters? I didn't sign it. Either. I can't tell you. As soon as I say that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh boy. So I'm going to start this out saying I have no hats. I have no terpenes. <laughs> I feel like uh, that's a tall order to follow. Nor did I bring you any samples, guys. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sure I could help at some point. <laughs> um, so as introduced, uh, my name is Bill Nichols. Um, I am the technical director of Biotrax. Actually, half of our, oh yeah, here's the hat. Who was the winner? Oh, he just walked out. Yeah, he just walked out. Okay. Oh, yeah. Gotta get him. Um, I am the technical director at Biotech Testing Laboratory here, um, right outside of Buffalo in Chittawaga, New York. Um, we're right off the 33 as you go toward um, the 90. And actually, I just realized as I was walking around handing out turkeys that over half of our staff is in the building right now um, with it. So, um, you know, I, I wanted to spend this time in a lot of the reasons why. Um, we start talking about getting people together is I get a lot of the same phone calls every day. Um, and there's a lot of confusion. And some of the confusion is, is that those regulations are written in a lot of legally speak and such um, that can be difficult uh, to, to deal with. And then the other part about that is, as I've heard from several people today and um, whatnot, is these things are constantly changing, right? They're changing by the week at this point. I don't even want to say it's by the month. I feel like, I feel like especially if you're on like any of the candy channels or something, they post an update every uh, uh, Friday or so, sometimes on Mondays, of changes that's happened on the OCM site. And there's something every week. It might not all be lab stuff, but there's something um, every week. But uh, before I get into that, I do want to say a little bit about Biotrax. Um, Biotrax has been around for over 20 years. Um, it was started by um, Ed. Um, we also have Ed and uh, Steve here. And the person that's actually running the AV is also one of our technicians. Um, so like I said, we, uh, we do have over half the staff here. We are a small lab um, that's been servicing the food and um, water space. I've only been with the lab now, believe it or not, it's almost been a year, I guess, <laughs> at this point. Um, but I've known um, Eddie and some of his crew for several years because I was a professor before this and moved into this space. Uh, and it's working with individuals outside of food and water isn't uncommon. We have been in the hemp space for almost five years. Um, so a lot of the adult use customers that we do get are actually hemp customers that have moved into the adult use space themselves, just like us. And luckily enough, we were in um, November of 22, granted um, the uh, first of three lab licenses that were additional from the original four medical um, laboratories. So. You know, we were lucky enough to do that. And with that, we've been um, able to service um, Western New York with that. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that today because there's a lot of challenges that go with this. There's a lot of um, misinformation that goes along with this. Um, and then there's tracking some things down. And I wanna spend some time not just spouting out a bunch of numbers and stuff. You can download the testing limits on, um, online in the lab section of the OCM website. I wanna spend some time talking about questions I get, what some of those answers might be for you, how to submit samples, and maybe some troubleshooting aspects with this as well um, that you can plan ahead of time. There's a reason why this was done in April the way it was, and that's because some of these talks allow you to go out and plan for your next grow season, right? Everyone's already starting seeds. Everyone's getting ready to grow. This is the time to start thinking about all aspects of it. A lot of times people aren't thinking about testing until the very end, right? The problem with that is, is that then you're blindsided by what's going to actually happen, what the costs are, what you need in that regard. And sometimes when you plant, the, the planning that goes into that can really help you on the economic side when it comes to the testing um, portion of this. So again, I want to spend a little time um, dealing with and talking about that. So here's just some questions um, that uh, I get kind of every day. Um, part of my job at Biotrax is on the cannabis side of things is I uh, answer the phone call uh, or answer the phones. And with that, I tend to get quite a bit of 
um, the same questions over and over again. So I think one thing I want to point out here is your questions aren't bad. And I hear them over and over. And you're not alone, right? There are more of you that have the same questions. And that's the importance of coming together with this and talking about these things. But I, I hear things like, what tests do I need? Well, okay. That's a pretty big question. I'll, I'll answer that one here. Are you worried about regulations changing, costing you money? Okay. Cultivators especially got that feeling about a month ago, right? How many cultivators were planning on some sobriety of wine testing? And then all of a sudden, on a random Wednesday afternoon, we got an email okay, that it just went away. No lead time, no anything. Right? There's also the fact that regulations can change. What if I tested last week? Am I going to have to retest this week because they changed the regulations of it? Right? That's something I get asked a lot. Does anyone know the answer to that question? You tested last week. Let's say our lab sent to you a certificate of analysis for your gummy line, let's say. Is that still good if they go and they change the regulations related to those gummies? Yes. 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 However, <laughs> that is what the OCM has told us more times than one, but yet in the hemp space, actually, we're seeing test results from last fall when the regulations are one way, now being told they have to change them. So what's being said is not always true in that regard. We haven't seen that in the adult use space yet, but if regulations change, there are a precedent set that if your COA was good at the time before the regulation changed, that you would not have to retest. What we don't have clarity on is what happens if your product is in the middle of testing. Right? Does tests take different time frames? What if I have three quarters of your um, process done and we're still waiting, then something changes? I'm still waiting on that answer today. One big thing is, as I go through the different things you test for, um, I get asked why or um, why do I need to test for that? Right? They don't understand. There's a lot of things in the adult use space that is tested for that is not tested for in the Hemp space, right? So, um, you know, we can clarify some of that as well um, with this. And we do find that this is certainly more uh, regulated than that. Also, what do my results tell me? The results that you get from us at Biotrax or any of the other 12 laboratories in the state um, besides us, they can really tell you about your process, your grow, where to go next with it. Okay? And I want to spend some time talking about that too. And then, of course, there's always the old mighty dollar. How much will it cost? Okay. I'm here to tell you it's not cheap. I'll be the first one to tell you it's not cheap. Our owner will be the first one to tell you it's not cheap. I will tell you, though, the more things the OCM adds, the only the worse that's going to get. Right. And that's a problem. It's something we need to think about as we work with regulators and we're going through these problems and we have face time, not only just with regulators, but even our um, individual representation uh, within the state. Okay. So, um, I want to tackle this first part of how do we know what to test? I get so many phone calls from individuals such as yourself that goes, I'd like to just send some samples. Huh? Okay. I would like your samples too. But what are you testing for? What's the purpose for it? So many people call me and are like, I want a full compliance channel. Okay. I mean, we can do that for you. However, do you need that? Right? They just think that that's what they should order. So I have a conversation of breaking down, well, what is it that you actually need? Are you testing final product that's going to go to retail? Are you testing stuff that's going to go to a processor, right? <clears throat> like Jim, uh, that was up here this morning. Um, you know, you might not need a full compliance panel, for instance, because Jim told me I could use him as an example uh, since he was here today too. Um, he doesn't require a full panel, right? Full panel, let's say you're selling flour. A uh, nice whole flour to a processor to help you bag it because you don't want to do it yourself um, as a cultivator. That's fine. That's something you're allowed to do. That full cool, that cool flour uh, that you're doing, you know, for instance, you would need for somewhere like Jim, metals, aspergillus test at minimum, potency. And then from there, it kind of differs depending on what processor um, you use. So I have to have those conversations with it. And I kind of keep a log of what processors need what. But even those processors are changing what they need, right? What they were doing before, realize it might not have been enough or it might have been too much. But if you go ahead and you do a full compliance panel for me because you're selling biomass to a processor, 
there's some items there that you probably don't need me to do or our staff to do things like moisture analysis and stuff, curing process, those sorts of things. Okay. So I'm going to ask you those questions to save you the money um, on those sorts of things. Now, a lot of this comes back to terminology of testing, right? So terminology testing, we have different types of testing that exist. If you're making a, what the OCM calls a value added product, you may need to do homogeneity testing to make sure that your product is homogenous. They are not uh, enforcing that actually right now uh, very well, but there are talks of doing that. If, if this is new to you, it's because it's in the regs, but yet they're not enforcing it. Harvest testing or batch testing. This would go along with like R&D testing. You needed, you were selling your biomass to a processor to make concentrates, something along those lines. Line testing. The line testing went away for whole flower products, pre-roll products, those sorts of things. It did not go away completely. You can still do line testing if you're a processor making a value-added product, such as carts, gummies, those sorts of things, right? Do they all want to? No, right? There's downsides and upsides to line testing. One is you don't get as much information out of it, right? Because your line testing is literally composite or pooling these sorts of things together, okay? For instance, a line of gummies might come in with five different 10 milligram THC, uh, Delta 9 THC gummies, all of those because they're similar products, but let's say those five are different flavors, they can get pulled as one, right? They used to do this with flour too. However, the line testing program kind of got out of hand because they never put a max or a cap or a limit to it, which means that you can have a line testing program, one that doesn't do potency, that would end up with 20 plus samples in it, right? That's odd to us because as I mentioned before, we're a food testing lab. Okay. We see what's called composite testing all the time in food. If somebody came to us and wanted to do 20 samples in one, we wouldn't take that testing. There's no information that you can discern from that that's going to be usable, okay? especially on the safety realm of things. Same thing here. That's how they were doing it. Now, um, beyond this, though, you can always test the product line, a, a, a lot of product accordingly. Um, with it individually, it doesn't have to be put into a line. If you do do line testing, though, let's say you are a processor, you are making a gummy, you want to use line testing, you do have to get OCM approval for that line before it can come to the lab. Product testing, on the other hand, you don't. Okay, product testing, you can have your line package, you have your lot that's followed that material through. Um, along with the lot number, and you can go ahead and get that product tested. But then again, uh, with this, you know, there's a confusion. Uh, product testing, uh, I get this on the phone all the time, people call it line. They really mean lot, right? Two L words isn't exactly the best. Some call it batch. By the way, inside the regs, depending on which reg you're reading, batch and lot are used interchangeably, and it's confusing, right? You would think that they'd want to level out that type of language, but they don't. Now, you see this fancy chart. This is a chart that you might have seen um, a few times over. Um, this chart is the number of samples you need to bring to me. Now, right this second, as of this moment, but probably will change come June, um, you will have to use a sampling firm for the package material to bring that material to the laboratory. Right now, you can do it yourself. And how you do this is based off of this chart that's in several of the regulation documents. And with that, it's based off of what's known as a unit. Okay. How many people in here? Not you, sir. Um, <laughs> how many people in here can explain to me what a unit means in the um, It's a final product package product that is complete final retail packaging doesn't necessarily have to have the final detail later, though. Correct. So uh, do you want to add to that? Yeah. Okay. So that's that's a perfect description. It's an individual product, okay, that is packaged fully. And yes, in this case right now, it doesn't have to have a label. It just has to be in the package site that's going to go to market. Now, why do I bring this up? Units come in all different shapes and sizes in this industry, right? You have eights that are going to be three and a half round packages. Sometimes they're in jars, sometimes they're in mylar bags, whatever it might be. You can have ounce containers. I've seen some places have 14 gram containers, so half and half ounce containers. Okay, that's all fine. That makes sense. 
The biggest one though that I have to explain to people is gummies. Okay. I made a I made a hundred thousand gummies. Okay. Well, how many packages did you make though? You're not packaging one gummy per pack, right? The gummies that we usually get are in packs of five or ten, depending on the strength of those gummies. So with that, that individual package would be a unit. So if you made a hundred thousand gummies, but you're packaging them in tens, you really made ten thousand units, right? Now, why this is important, because that's a big difference in my chart here, right? If you have 10,000, you only need to give me 20 representative samples, okay? If it's 100,000 patches of gummies, you have to give me 50. Now, remember why that matters, because if you're giving us a bio track for those samples, you're not only just paying for testing, that's all the stuff you're not selling, right? So we need to pay attention to the chart to make sure that you're giving enough to meet regulations, but not too many so that you have that product to sell, okay? So that's an important aspect of this chart, and it is a confusion that I probably have a conversation about once a week um, on the phone with this, okay? So there's, again, there's a lot to this. Now, there's also, um, you know, the difference in terminology and stuff, and if you are reading through the regs or you're somebody who's looking to prospectively get into this space, sit down with the definitions first. It'll make the reading of the regs a lot easier, um, for it because of things like this, lot, batch, line, with it. Thanks. All right, so here are all the regulated tests in New York State, okay? Now, is this all the tests that can be done? No, at here at Biotrack, there's actually several other tests that we can um, perform for you, but these are the regulated um, tests. And up above, beyond the, the regulated tests on the left-hand side, up above, I've marked what tests are actually needed, okay, for final product testing for whatever product that you might be looking to produce. Now, if you look at that, um, when it comes to flower and pre-roll or flower material, there's quite a few more tests than um, some of the other items that exist on there. Um, is it the only thing that you might need to test for? No, right? Okay. We're just trying to get up. Oh, <laughs> this comes back to my professor days. Is it better over here? Is it better over here? Okay. Um, so the person running the camera, though, should know because she was a student for two years of mine. <laughs> um, with this in mind, though, uh, the terpene aspect of this is something that can be requested, but realize if you're requesting testing, it is not part of most labs testing packages. So when you get a full compliance packaging, these sorts of things have to be ordered in addition to the full compliance panel itself. Now, when do you need terpenes to actually be done? Because I have marks there saying it's not required. Unfortunately, that's not 100% true. If you are making a package claim, a uh, quantification of those terps inside of your um, product, whatever it might be, you do actually need a terpene test to back that up. If it's something you just want to provide customers that might be looking at your certificate of analysis, of course you can do it too. Are you required to? No. Okay. But maybe it's a selling point for your uh, varietal of flower or something, right? Whatever it might be. Um, people have different aspects to it. Now, again, I'm not here to talk about action limits um, and I can provide this to anybody and I do have the action limits actually after the end of my presentation in case there's any questions and answers about it. Um, but you can kind of see a basic outline there um, in the second column for it, okay? So again, there's a lot to this aspect of things, and I keep wanting to go in professor mode and ask if anyone has questions as I go through this, but then I realize we have a QA and a afterward too um, for it. All right, next to this is pricing for it. This is a chart that changes frequently, okay? Here is the base price. Now you might ask, well, why don't I just have full compliance panels um, sitting down there? And it's the fact that you don't always have to do compliance. If you're selling material to uh, like a processor, again, you don't have to follow a full compliance panel unless that processor is part of your deal does require that um, in some way. So that's something to think about. Now you can see that these prices differ for it. Really, the big price difference in the compliance packages there, the price difference comes down to the fact that uh, residual solvents are required in non most non-flower products. Um, so that's a pretty big 
um, additional cost that comes along with it. Otherwise, it's pretty standard. Now, this is the base price that you'll find on um, Biotrax's website or uh, C CBD Verify, where this is listed um, for it. So this is what I put down, but there are um, discounts and things for volume uh, pricing for it or uh, utilizing services on a regular basis, et cetera. Um, but you can see there that there's a reason why I'm talking about this in the sense of you need to plan, right? Because these prices get pretty hefty quickly. If you're making flower products, for instance, okay, what are some ways that you can kind of deal with the cost of this? Well, let's say you want to make flower products and you want to package different sizes. Okay? Discuss that with your lab. Okay? Line testing doesn't exist, but there are ways where you don't have to pay for more than one test for the same strain of flour. Let's say you want to package your flour to eights. You want to package your flour into uh, 14 gram or half ounce um, containers. You can do that under the same test. All you have to do is break into two separate lockers under the same material, okay? As I'm talking, there's just been some big names in the industry who keep walking in <laughs> um, with it. So there's different things that you could add in that. That's still one test, okay? If you go through the documents, and I have, I've confirmed this five times with um, the OCM, you know, you can go ahead and kind of package these together. But you'll note that I call, said call for support right? Not just bring stuff in. The reason for this is because when I have these conversations with you, when I start breaking down what your individualistic situation is, we can start sussing out ways to try to make testing cheaper for you. For instance, I just had samples come in where we were able to bundle Keef, three and a half gram and 14 or uh, 28 gram samples all as one test by just making sure the lock codes are written correctly on the forms. One test instead of three. That's huge when you can go and you can start saving 33% of um, the cost. Now, where does that not work? Okay. Do I see a pan? Yeah. Uh, those three lots you said you combined it in one. Do you see the packaging the same? Correct. Yep. I'm about to get into that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, where does this not work? The, the first one is since you already brought it up, uh, it was going to be the second thing I said, but you brought it up packaging. Okay. The three packagings. Um, or three items have to be within the same brand of packaging, same material of packaging um, and whatnot. And there are ways to submit samples to make sure that all the packaging is accounted for, okay? So we do have ways around that. Where something wouldn't work out is, is let's say you're putting your eights in Mylar bags, but then you're putting your ounces in jars. That's two different types of packaging. Even if it comes from the same vendor, they're completely different materials. But what if I have ounce jars and I have eighth jars, okay? Same brand, same maker, same everything. There is ways to do that. Does that answer? Yeah, more than three roll space. <laughs> okay, so I'll get into that next then because there's even more questions in that uh, regard. So what this doesn't follow though is the pre-roll aspect to it. Pre-rolls because it's not whole flower product does not count and you do have to um, test for those individually. So even if you have blueberry muffin as whole flour, you've had that tested, but then you go and you do pre-rolls of blueberry flour or blueberry muffin, you still have to do that. I'm not sure where you're going with the pre-rolls. Okay, so if I have a dog walker, you've got yeah. a single one gram, 98 percent or whatever, and a single two in flour, same thing. Same but what's the difference is in the paper and filter on it? That would likely be possible, yeah. I would have to know exactly which ones you're doing, but yeah, that would be that would be yeah. That's why it's very important when you guys put together things to get your packaging. For a packaging company that's very Transparent. Yep. So you can use it across all different lines. So you can do this. Yeah. For your sake, and, and pre-roll, you guys are going to go broke and nobody wins. And the pre-roll side of things, too, realize that there are brands of paper and stuff that will hit on New York State tests, especially heavy metal tests. So you do need to make sure not only you're careful on the packaging you use, but also the actual material you're building your product with as well. This goes along with gummies, too. If you make a line of gummies, 
and you're using another produce item, well, guess what? You need to make sure you're safe with pesticides and things of that too. Because right now it's not concentrates that are tested, it's the actual final product of it. So pesticides that come in, not on the cannabis, but might come in on the blueberries itself, certainly will still matter in that test. For no question. No question. Yes. All right. So um, we kind of started covering this, um, but a few more things when it comes to talking about how do I save when it comes to testing? Well, again, one way is to maximize products um, within what you grow. So making sure that you utilize the plant in all aspects um, that you physically can will be go a long way with that. Working on testing and uh, your margins certainly will go along with that. Research and development testing. It might feel like a greater cost up front, but a lot of that research and development testing that you do can't be used for compliance because we haven't filled the whole packaging guidelines and everything. But what it can <laughs> fulfill is a lot of the questions of where you need to go with your next steps, right? If you go ahead and you just take flour you've grown, flour that's been sitting there, you package it right up. The problem is now if you take the time, okay, and the packaging material um, before you really know anything about the product that's going into it, okay? That's a lot of money. We all know that labor costs a ton, and I'm sure as a lot of people are getting their packaging in right now, packaging costs a ton, right? So we need to make sure that you have the information you need before you move to those steps and you go and spend 10, 20, 30 grand and truthfully, I actually might be saying those numbers a little too low right. times by what I'm thinking. So it's us sitting here going, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, nonetheless, you do um, see those sort of things. With this, though, um, one thing that scares me uh, in the industry is as the rules sit right this moment, and again, there are things that people are working on, and hopefully there's hopes that rules might change. We can only really deal with what we know right this minute, okay, is grow fewer strains and grow more of it. I remember going back to that chart that I showed you guys earlier, right? You can scale and give me more, but that's still only one test. Whether you're submitting me five A's or submitting me 20 A's, okay? It's still the single cost of the test. You're giving a little bit more up, but if you do the math out, you save a lot on the back end. When you're growing 20, 30 strains that some individuals did this year, it's going to be very difficult on the testing side of things to pay for that, right? 30 strains at, let's say, $1,000, because I don't want to do the math on 950 off the top of my head right now. Um, you know, you're talking $30,000 just if you were making it. Forget if you're making other products such as pre-rolls and stuff, where if you can knock that down to five, 10 strains, you can knock those costs down um, exorbitantly, right? So again, these are all what things that you need to plan. Now, I did put the uh, bugaboo in the room, okay, on there. Um, you'll note that I put a nice picture of aspergillus, right? The picture of aspergillus is there because this is the number one item that we find um, has concerns. And those concerns are greater along the lakes here in Western New York than anywhere else it seems. Now, I don't have published research to back that. I just have a pool of data that I'm basing that off of and locations because you guys have to provide your address to me when you uh, submit samples. Um, for it. And with that, um, the moisture off the lakes do have a tendency of feeding these things. Now, you will also note this picture has more than just the regulated species there. Okay? There's over 200 plus species of aspergillus. So just because you have mold or you see mold or something had popped up, doesn't mean that it's necessarily one of the uh, pathogenic species that is regulated by the state, but it also doesn't mean that it isn't, right? Um, you know, I don't know how many mycologists we have in the room, but some of these species, when you're looking at them in um, their form, they're hard to tell the difference for. Uh, for this, we do use PCR technology to, to differentiate those different species. So we're actually moving to a, a, a nucleotide level um, to do this. Because again, the problem with aspergillus is, is it's not a quantification. It's not like you can have a little bit and still sell your product. When it comes to aspergillus, it is either a pass or fail. So it cannot actually be present in your product. Okay. That's key. Um, and a lot of people don't understand that. And the reason why I bring that up is a lot of people will call, they'll have a positive, they'll get the report, let's say it's R and D, and then I'll get a call of how much? Well, our instruments, nor anyone's instruments is usually not calibrated 
to quantify that. We can kind of get an idea. So we've looked at things enough and all the SOPs are standardized. So we kind of get an idea, but it's not like yeast and mold and aerobic tests that exist where we're actually quantifying down to the quantity forming unit per gram or per mil of material that you have. So, you know, we're just giving it that it is present. Now, again, we can look back at those yeast and mold results though, and you can get an idea of how prolific it is though. The problem with it is that yeast and mold results will include aspergillus, but it will also include all the other individuals in the fungal group, right? So again, it's not a perfect example, but these are sorts of things that when I bring up the idea of a COA, that you can start kind of poking at getting an understanding um, uh, which brings me to paperwork, right? If you go to CBD-Verify, you'll find the two forms we need um, with it. And the paperwork uh, that you need to submit to us at this moment is a chain of custody. And then the, the state requires a New York State transfer manifest for all adult use products. Now, a lot of people ask me why the transfer manifest. Also, a lot of people have a tendency of filling them out when they're in the lab. That actually kind of defeats the purpose. The whole purpose of the transfer manifest is to tell you where you're going and why. So if you were to get pulled over, for instance, and you have, you know, three ounces of weed in your, well, actually three ounces of weed, four ounces of weed in your car, you won't get in trouble for that, right? You, they know based on the law that you're coming from wherever you were to the lab, and that's why you had what you have. Okay, so again, that's an understanding piece um to this now chain of custody uh this is our chain of custody at biotrack or at least the first iter or the current iteration of it there's a lot of pieces of information here that you need to provide um to provide us one is your company information sometimes you submit products sometimes there's problems with those products sometimes there's just general questions about it once I start opening it up, I need a way to contact you. Steve needs a way to contact you. Somebody needs to contact you if there's problems. Right? I've had people submit packaging with items. Let's say they submit their 20 items. We start opening those and we count them, right? But they're opaque. Can't see in them. Open it up. Wait, there's nothing in here. It's happened more than once. Um, and whatnot, and then that's a problem, right? Because now you haven't officially submitted all of those samples. Why that happened that way, I'm not sure um, with it, but nonetheless, that's part of it. So give us a way to contact. The other big one here is in the sample section. It's not only just sample name, right? It's putting your batch ID or lot ID number with it. Some people have very complicated numbers. Some numbers are very easy. You can submit a second sheet with this if you have to. The numbers are very complicated. But this is the only way that the OCM, once your samples turned in, can track your material through your grow to what you brought to the lab. If they need to trace anything back, that number needs to go along with it. Plus, for years now, if you go throw the same strain over, over and all, over and over again, and you go and you say, it keeps crying, oh, gelato, 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 your paperwork's going to get confusing right now because you only had one harvest. Maybe you only have one gelato. The next year you're growing gelato, you year after that you're growing gelato. It gets confusing. The lot numbers, though, will help straighten that out uh, with it. But I'd say probably 50% of people don't actually put the lot numbers, and I we have to contact them or ask them when they come to the lab and drop off materials. The other part is right here, total batch size, total unit sample. Remember the chart that I pointed out where it says if you built 10,000, you have to submit 20. That's where that information goes. Total batch size, that's what you're making. Cultivators that have not bagged everything yet. Estimate it. You know your poundage, you know how many ACE you should be able to be able to get into a pound, right? Estimate it to the best of your knowledge with it. If you have to, slightly overestimate it, right? Because if you go out and you try to sell 200 more ACE than you had before with it, one, it could put you in another tier, which means it, you could be against regulations. But second to that, that's when red flags are going to come um, from the OCM auditors and those sorts of things. So, you know, make sure that you do have an understanding of that. Now, did something there catch your, you know, Mm, interest there. Right now in New York State, for cultivators that are bagging flour, you don't actually, if you're submitting final compliance, 
you technically, as of about a month ago, or all the dates are kind of blending in, might have been five weeks ago, you don't have to have every item packaged ahead of time, and you don't have to have your label on it. You can bag the material you need ahead of time, so you're not wasting thousands of bags, thousands of jars, and only bag what you need for the lab. Now, there's some onus there, though, because there's not a sampling program yet. It's on you to make sure you're giving me a representative sample of your growth, right? Trying to make sure that you get through that harvest back or that, that harvest. You're going to be getting the in end material. You're not all taking it from one spot, okay? Because, again, it's up to you to, to get a representative sample. I'm not there with you. I make sure that what you bring me is representative in our testing, but I can only deal with what you bring me, right? But, again, save on labels. Save on packaging other things until you get those things or that information back, especially if you didn't do R&D testing, okay? Because if you didn't do any R&D testing, you go and you package up everything, it only takes one aspergillus hit to lose those 10,000 units. It only takes one nickel hit to lose those 10,000 units, right? Or worse, maybe you're not losing the material, but you're at least losing the bags, right? Because now you have to debag that. Let's say it's aspergillus, you do have a chance to remediate it and retest. So you can go through that, but there's no getting those bags back. There's no cleaning those bags. There's no way of dealing with those bags. Okay. So these are aspects to it. With this, too, um, you can mark off any different type of, as I mentioned before, research and development test. And then it's just simply signing um, that you're handing it over to us and we sign that we receive it. Okay. So that's kind of the chain of custody with it. We also have the New York Transfer Manifest. It should... The item line should mimic the item lines on the chain of custody, and then you should fill out all the information. Yes, section three <coughs> is the lab that you're ending at. The only people that this changes for or could change for are the individuals who are samplers, which we do have at least two official samplers in the room. Okay, um, They might be sampling multiple farms so therefore they might have multiple stops along their way let's say a sampler is going out to you know it's local here going out to rochester well it would behoove them it would behoove their customers right to have two or three stops at once to save on travel okay because they can split travel between them that's represented on this form and i'm not going to go too far into this but again the big thing about the transfer manifest it's pretty simple to fill out uh once you've looked at it once the thing that you do need to realize, though, is you really should have it filled out before you get into the car, okay? Because that moving that material is when this form really matters. I have to keep it on file because the OCM says I do. You know how often we look at this form after I sign it that we took it from you? Zero. We look at it, zero. The chain of custody, this is your order form. This isn't just tracking your samples. This is also telling the lab what you're doing, what the bill's going to be, what you want. Okay. And a lot of times when you do submit this, we'll ask you questions to make sure you're getting what you want. And also the other way, we're not doing something and charging you for something that you didn't really want. Okay. Also with both of these forms, if you have an error, take your pen, one line through, initial next to it and date. Do not scribble crazily. Okay. That's just a way, it's kind of just a thing within compliance. Of course, now maybe I'm stealing stuff from you. Oh, please. <laughs> yeah. um, with this, uh, you know, it's just kind of standard, what, no matter what industry you're working in that has forms and stuff, you don't want to make it where it looks like you're hiding something. You want to put one line through. It's fine that there's a correction. You don't always need to rewrite it unless there's a lot of issues. Um, and you can go ahead and move on with that correction. To it. Okay. So last real thing here is certificate of analysis. Um, what does my certificate mean? What is my certificate telling me there? Okay? There's some things that people don't realize that are in the regulations that we have to look for. First one, stem size. Okay? You're trimming, you're packaging flour up, you're training a new set of trimmers. Maybe you're creating an organization of trimmers, if I heard that right. It's not mine. Oh, okay. Well, wh whomever it is, okay. Stem size matters. Three millimeter stem size, okay. And that can't be over a certain amount of weight of the flower that comes in. So we have to actually take the flower, look at it, and we actually have calipers that we sanitize. 
ties we the stems we have to sit there and measure them okay now at this point i've looked at enough of them steve's looked at enough of them that we can kind of tell uh, where the problems are where it's not but a lot of people don't believe that that exists there but if you go to the filter form material section it does and i tell you what i haven't yet but the most disheartening phone call i'll probably ever have to make is could you have trimmed better so that we didn't have to fail you um because that would just be the worst phone call but it's something to think about it's a lot of things that people aren't necessarily looking at we have had people bring in r d samples where i asked them is this really your finished product because the stems are too large and then they would have it gone back and and dealt with that um the other part of this is, is going back to the aspergillus piece so you have issues with aspergillus okay you also look at the yeast and mold numbers do you realize aspergillus Stachy coli species, so the Shingatoxin coli and Salmonella species are regulated in New York State as either just presence or as, as fail. There's no limits, there's no anything. Aerobic and yeast and mold, as many of you know, did have action limits. They no longer have action limits for whole flour. Okay? The action limits were taken away last October um, with it, but the number itself still has to be reported. Now, it's not an action limit when you're thinking about your grow. It's not an action limit in the sense of um, that we will pass and fail you as a laboratory. But yet yeah, that information still is available to retailers and stuff. If they see high numbers, that might not be a product they want to buy, right? Especially with limited number of retailers right now, guys, they have the right to pick and choose if they, if they want to. Okay, so that's something to think about that. And as we talk about GMP later, or if you ever want to have that conversation more too with us, you know, that's something to think about because those numbers will come up um, in that process. You know, I had somebody come to me, a very predominant person in the industry come to me about eight weeks ago, showed me some results and said, well, what is this? What, why is it this way? They were seeing almost no yeast and mold values on it. I think it was like 700 CFUs per uh, gram. That's not much, right? It's very minimalistic to none with it, but yet they had over 200,000 CFUs of aerobic bacteria. And when I say, well, what, what, what can you get from your COA besides something that lets you go and sell your product and how we can better ourselves? I would bet money if I was a fly on the wall in that room that sure enough, somebody was handling that product without gloves. Okay. Because your hands and stuff aren't going to yield a lot of yeast and mold, but it will yield a ton of aerobic bacteria. We have all kinds of natural flora on our skin where I could swab you and get those types of numbers. Okay. And again, that's something that you have to think about when you're working with those types of um, products to it. Okay. The other part of this is aflatoxins, or sorry, mycotoxins. Aflatoxins, there's four regulated aflatoxins, one ochre toxins. Where do these come from, right? A lot of people think that those mycotoxins shouldn't have to be tested for if they don't have aspergillus, okay? Well, here's the problem with that. Mycotoxins do not come from just those four pathogenic aspergillus species. Mycotoxins can come from various, for instance, overtoxins can come from various penicillin species, okay? Also, you can go through a remediation process kill the living aspergillus that's there or kill off the spores but yet the aspergillus that was there living could still leave mycotoxins behind right that means there's still a risk factor behind it and if you don't know these these uh, mycotoxins they are carcinogenic and they do build up in fatty tissues okay so that's a pretty specific um you know important piece to understand because it's not necessarily mutually exclusive to just the pathogenic aspergillus um, that are listed um, there, okay? So again, there's a lot that your COA can tell you um, with these things. And there's a lot of information there that you can glean and get um, from this aspect, okay? Now, the last thing, um, just because I get this phone call too, where people are surprised when I tell them this sort of thing, we are a New York State licensed lab. As of this moment, we are able to take any licensees tests that might need, whether it be a retailer that's worried about material um, that's coming into their store, uh, whether it's, um, you know, a processor that's got final product or doing research and development tests, building a new product, 
whether it's cultivator trying to sell their stuff or even processes throughout their grow um, that they might want. Because do you remember we, as a food and water lab, we can do things like uh, E. coli tests um, for water. We are a licensed water lab um, as well. But we can also do Native American organizations in New York State. Right? We can do medical patients that are growing themselves. Let's say you have a medical card you're growing the three mature three immature plants and we can also do the general public okay so that's something to realize as part of it so even if you're growing your own or you're a medical card holder you want to know what your potency is so you know how to dose yourself we can help you with that okay right. we're not limited to just new york state licensees i can go forever but i'm going to <laughs> All right, we are going to have a Q and A at the end of our <laughs> afternoon presenters. Um, on the on the thing that Malia mentioned, if anybody did come in and did not register, whether in the morning or coming in, just raise your hand, let her know. They, the Kansas Workforce Initiative sponsors it, and they need to have a record that they're doing their job. So the more we show in the state that they are, the more like things like this will get to be able to present. The other thing I want to let everyone know about lunch is that it was provided by Underground's Coffee House and Roastery here in this So we're going to move on to more and more compliance. Um, I'm going to introduce Michelle Vaughn. She is the president and CEO of Compliance Team, LLC. I mentioned earlier this morning that I'm the chair of the Cultivation Committee for CANI, the Cannabis Association of New York. And Candy does do a lot of lobbying and legislate, uh, works with the OCM and the legislators to, to move things here and to shape this industry. One of the things that we're providing, one of the things we're pushing for is for cultivators to be able to continue to minimally process their own products, meaning do our own free roll. Um, and so, and trim our own wheat even. You know, there's some things in the regulation that may restrict some of those things. And so in the conversations among cultivators, one of the questions is, if the state does in fact allow us to do that, are they then going to create all kinds of regulatory uh, issues and you know hoops to jump through, some of which may have to do with gap and GME uh, standards? And so we thought we needed to get Michelle here to explain to us what that means. And of course, it has an impact for anyone applying for or currently um, in possession of a process or manufacturing license. Everybody in process supply chain would know about this. These are the regulatory standards. And so with that, I give you Michelle. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. I'm Michelle. Before we start, how many of you have attempted to build a compliance for your cultivation facility? How many of you have completed the compliance? <laughs> Oh, how many have completed the compliance plan? <laughs> wow. Um, how long did it take you to complete that compliance plan? Yes. Did everyone hear that? I hear it. So um, what I'm going to talk about today are the differences between what New York State is now required to do for every cannabis grow operation and every cannabis manufacturer, producer, extractor. They must be certified in good agricultural practice and good manufacturing practice. So what that means is on a from a business standpoint, just like Bill was saying, you have to plan for your testing. You're going to have to plan to build your compliance plan at the same time you're building your business out. Because these two things go hand in hand. You're in a regulated industry that is not going to be forgiving. So we'll we'll go into those some of those things. Um, we'll talk about gap, and especially at the end, I want to talk about auditing requirements. And have any of you been audited yet? Okay, I'm going to ask some questions when we get there and see how that went for you. Um, but what I was saying earlier, one of the reasons that OCM is doing this is because they're looking at a risk based approach. And that, and it's very similar to FDA. And I want to back up a little bit and tell you that my background is in, in regulatory compliance for pharmaceuticals, um, medical devices, biologics, and proteins, and um, manufacturing in general for 
the healthcare industry or the life sciences industry. So what we do in that industry is very, very similar to what needs to be done in cannabis. It's less stringent in cannabis, but nonetheless, just as important because now instead of being regulated by FDA, you will be regulated by OCM. So yeah, good agricultural practice. When Bill was talking about testing, he started talking about, I guarantee that they weren't wearing gloves when they were collecting their samples. <clears throat> so this is a, a very important piece to this whole, this whole list here. These are some examples of SOPs that you would be required to write for your cultivation facility. In addition, proving that you're following these SOPs. So when you write your book of SOPs, that doesn't mean you're done. That means that's the start. Because what happens is you write the SOP, you have to train your staff to follow that SOP and then prove to the OCM that your staff understands it and they're qualified and they know how to prevent future problems. So one of the biggest here, which one would it be, Bill? Uh, quality control, probably the testing of RFC material. So, what, for example, you have to write an SOP. How are you harvesting the material? Are you wearing gloves? Are you trimming with the right equipment? Are you doing all the procedures that are required for that step? And is it documented? And are all of the trained personnel, and I'm not sure you can find them yet until you train them, um, how exactly how to do that process. And the reason the SOPs are so critical is because it's your job now as an owner to make sure that everything you do from, F, from stage A to Z is repeatable and it is consistent and you get the same result every time. That's the whole reason to have the SOP in place for any of these procedures and more that will be required for cultivation. You need to do that from a, a repeatability standpoint because that's what's going to get you a good product in the end. And if you don't follow these steps and suddenly you're trimming incorrectly and you have to waste money on a test that you didn't, you wouldn't have had to waste if you trimmed properly or had a right stem size, then you're in a much better place following the procedure. So one of the things that's important about these SOPs is that. <clears throat> It's kind of weird, but you almost have to look at them like an employee. They're li a living thing. They have to follow certain rules, and it is the foundation of your documentation in-house. Just like an employee is the foundation to get the work done, if your SOPs aren't written and documented and followed, that's a real problem for your industry your business because the OCM is going to come in, and that's how they rate you. Your SOPs, your documentation, and what the employees are doing to keep the facility clean, to keep your operations running smooth. If those things aren't there, that's where you get hit by those. Yeah. And the fines can be big. Um, let's see, do we need to talk about these? I think we need to talk about testing plans and testing protocols. <laughs> that's a good one because it's going to follow you though. So um, when you grow, when your crops are done, you harvest, how many of you have a plan for your testing protocol and what it should be before you send it to Bill? And how has that helped you in the past? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, everyone needs to repeat this. Yeah, I mean, it's safe. Yeah, it's still on the your numbers are holding for it. And your material, everything is about an ankle grab, I feel like, with your lab analysis, like a weight and drop sample, it determines what your results are going to be. So it's good being consistent, having a SOP in place. Exactly. And the idea is when you're building out the compliance plan, which is your overreaching, and I'll talk about that in a minute, it's your, it's your high level plan for how all the SOPs will be followed. But the, especially with the testing side, you, you literally have to spell out when you're going to test, what you're going to test, and what the results should really be. And then when you send that off to the lab, 
Phil can say, uh, 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 that's not quite right, let's work on this. And then you can alter your SOP if it's not accurate. So then it gives you the, the foundation to say, okay, let's let's make sure our testing protocol is tight. We're gonna do the same thing every time. And Bill's gonna say yes or no, <laughs> and test us for it. What's that? You can also call it. Yeah, she could. <laughs> to write your SOP. And another thing you have to realize when you're doing these SPPs, it is a living document. Exactly. It is not set in stone. No. Nope. If you, if I go to, because I'm also an auditor, if I go to an NWRC or ask you about it, and I look and I look at the change record on the bottom, and that's been changed for four years, I call BS yes, right. Exactly. I mean, ours sometimes has three, four, five pages because we're doing something. Suddenly, guess what? Why are you doing it this way? You can do it this way. And it's actually faster, more efficient, and we get, you know, less. Thanks. Let's change that. You change three words in section 2.7.4, change the production. So, as you're working the SOPs, let, let the SOPs work for you and work for them and make those changes and just document the change. If it wasn't documented, it never happened. Period. Right. And that's a good point because that's part of the good agricultural practice certification. You need to have a very tight document control process in place. And that, that, that talks about. If you're going to alter the SOP, who's the signer of the SOP? You need a point person in house. You're, that is probably going to be one of your most critical hires is your quality manager on some level because they're the people that are going to keep all that documentation in place. They're going to be the owner of the document change. They're going to be the people that say, "What? Wait a second. We had this SOP in place last week. Uh, we changed some testing parameters." Uh, it's got signed off on how come you guys aren't following this now. So you need the consistency internally, but it's it's going to be a year-long process when you get all this stuff finalized and in place. Any questions on these up here? It's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. Um, just the fact going back to the sampling SMP. Oh, yeah, that's good. The line of change not having a package and everything. We had to package everything before we submitted the protocol online. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We had to have a sampling protocol at least to get the people. But, but now that uh, it's changed, we don't have to package every you know the final product. And our sampling plan is called the random number generator. So we'll actually grab the correct number of samples and the right numbers. Now that we're not packaging in the final product the entire plot. How do you go ahead and, and grab a representative sample that's that's not packaged? Okay, this is good. Um, I could add to it. Yeah. I got to okay, good. Yeah. Basically, example, you you would have to randomly take that amount of product, take it, weigh it, before you know, because you want to have the license stamp for that you don't have to sell the sample. I mean, you have to be good, but remember when you are sampling this is the big thing with astrogels. Let's say you have 20 strays, you have 20 totes you work on our 20 50 pound bags that you have already tripped up. The person takes the first sample, puts his gloves on, puts it in a bag, now picks up the bag off the floor with those gloves on, takes the second sample. You just contaminated bag two. So you have to think of it like you're in surgery, you're a doctor, this is a patient. Keep it as sterile, get sterile techniques, mm -hmm. build those into your SOPs. It's going to save your ass. Because yeah. we've seen residuals come through where the first flower was positive and the second, third, fourth was positive, and then the fifth one wasn't. Why? Because they took the gloves off, they had lunch, and they came back. So that the, 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 the overarching story here is that Everything you touch in your business now needs to have a process tied to it. And if the process needs to be tight, it can be changed at some point in time, but it needs to be a collective internally to say as a team, this is the process change because either the regulation changed or we're improving the process and you need to have a control process for how you sign off on that SOP. And then you better train all the employees to follow that SOP to its new change. That, that's the overriding issue there. And then on the, oh, and one thing I did want to talk about, because you and I had this discussion. Um, some 
we were talking, we were just talking about earlier about doing pre rolls in addition to harvesting and growing. So, according to New York State, you cannot do pre rolls and be a cultivator because the pre roll process now is considered a production process, it's a processing. So, according to OCM law today, it doesn't mean it'll be that way forever. It's you will need to have a separate license for cultivation and a separate license for production. So that's going to, again, it's going to be a business decision. Can you afford that? Can you do both? Because guess what? Now you have to have GMP certification and GAP certification. And I can tell you right now, from a GM and GAP perspective, you're looking at realistically in the cannabis space, Minimally fifty thousand to get to the documentation in place, a quality manager, process following, and to pay the third party auditor who's going to do the audit. So it's an endeavor. Um, but when you get on the manufacturing side, it can cost that much or up to two hundred fifty thousand because manufacturing can have multiple iterations you've got you can do the distillate you can do the uh, the, the pressing you can do all of the functions on the manufacturing side that have to be you need to write SOPs for and all those SOPs and remember this when you do your SOPs for grow those all need to be valid you can't just write an SOP and not show that it's working Yes. Hey, Michelle, do you think that uh, CPMP is going to be necessary for like limited processing for pre rolls? Wait, yes, that again. So, like, for example, I'm, I'm sure some of the agencies uh, are probably doing this. You can limited process right now yourself, and then it keeps pre rolls. Right. right. Um, eventually, there's like the processing licenses one's a brand only, one's a infusion and manufacturing, one's a cynic extraction. Right. Do we think that still, even if not getting a processing license from any small trade, we're going to have to be able to do limited processing? They might. I, I wish I knew that. I heard people say, you know, if you do that, I think if you do the lobbying, you might be able to get that. Yeah. We're working on it. But if, you, if the lobbying isn't successful, the likelihood that you'll have to have two separate licenses. Well, so here's the, this is why I asked the question because it gets a little bit up. So obviously an infusion of manufacturing like well exceeds a pre-roll limitation, right? For sure. But processing brand is really specific for white label. So there's like this kind of this in-between right here between people using the processing brand licensing for just simply having partnerships with people to do white labeling. And then you've got this infusion manufacturing component, which obviously exceeds pre-rolls the whole separate but you're gonna need probably CBMP to do pre-rolls which a lot of cultivators just throw up. Right. right. I think you're gonna need to I that's my gut but I was ready right. because I deal with the FDA and I know how this works. So <laughs> the other part about um which I'll get into in a minute <clears throat> with the piece of it, which is pre-roll and all the processes that we need to talk about mm -hmm. um not only do you have to follow the GMP standards, but guess what? The FDA says it now. Because this, the SOPs that are going to start to be required are actually I'll get to the slide. These are samples of GMP processes that are really important. And Bill and Eddie, the quality control is really applicable to you guys because what happens is on a manufacturing side, you still need to build a quality plan and a testing plan as you're building out your SOPs. And if you build the testing plan first, you protect yourself later because you're making sure you have appropriate product that goes out to the end consumer. And guys, just a reminder, we're gonna have a full on Q&A with all the panelists at the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here's, these items are, are a little different from cultivation, but, um, one, one item that is very relevant to all of you would be quarantine procedures. So what do you do when you have tainted product? How do you handle it? How do you handle when you have mold growth? Or how do you handle any of these things that you're finding tech 
do you have a process in place that for an injured product when you know it's going to damage the rest of your crop? That's hugely important for you because the more you can push that out and protect yourself, the better off you're going to be. And if the OCM ever catches wind that you've got tainted product and you're not quarantining it, that's an enormous audit finding. And they can they can basically find you for these things. In the in the cultivation, a fine can be up to about ten thousand, and in the GMP sector, the, it could be up to fifty thousand. Is that right, at least? Fines are different than just the thirteen percent. Okay, well, as of now, it's probably not there. Okay, that just gives you a sense for doing something wrong is not cheap. Do it right the first time. Pay to have your systems in place first before you get into other That's issues. Way. You're not gonna have to get these certifications for up to 12 months. I love that you just said that because yeah. you just made it easy for me. Oh, yeah. No, I <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you have 12 months, but your license is only good for two years. So I have five and nine months. Anyway. Right. That's, that's crazy. But listen to Elise because she knows that legal side and it's really good. So here we are. How is the FDA involved? Did you think the FDA would get involved? You did. Okay. Of course. So um, <laughs> I'm trying to come up with a really good story to talk about this. So there, the CFR is the Code of Federal Regulations, and that's the, the, the health area, 21 CFR. Part 117, that is for food. That covers food production and food source. And part 11 covers that dietary nutrition. So let's say you're selling your product and it's going to go into a manufacturer and they're going to make uh, gummies. So let's say that gummy has CBD in it and it's going to be used as a nutritional use and health benefits. How is that going to be regulated? Probably under the dietary supplement. So what that means is you as a business, the processor, will need to have a quality system filled with SOPs that are relevant, that are exactly compliant to FDA Part 170 for food. I'm sorry, for 111 for dietary. If you're making a gummy that's going to be just used as an edible, you're going to be following Part 111. Did I just mix that up? I did. Instead of back, I'm so sorry. 117 for food safety, but what that means is you're going to need a quality system in place to manage your kitchen. How are you cooking? Do you have uh, controls for health and safety, cleanliness? How are you cleaning your equipment? How are you testing for bio matter? How are you testing for pathogens in the food? So again, another quality SOP has to come into play to say this is how we're testing and this is how we're operating. So when the OCM comes in, they'll say, show me your documentation. And the FDA can now come in because you've got FDA SOPs in place. So the FDA can have jurisdiction over your food facility. That's another thing too. Just because you're not regulated federally by the FDA does not mean they can't come in and tell you you are not operating effectively because if you make claims on your products, and I know most of you are cultivators here, but if you're ever getting into micro or you're going to ever do GMP, if you make claims on your product that are health claims that say, you know, it can cure this, can do that, the FDA has full right to come in and say, nope, you cannot make these medical claims. You're not a federally approved product. And you can pull it off the market. And the last thing you want is a month is a product or recall because it's seven times more expensive than when you put in the pit. Probably 10 times more. And it's, it can get rough. So um, make absolutely sure that your whatever your labeling claims are, that's the key factor here, are very consistent with the regulation under FDA, food or dietary, and you follow that to a T. Because Firm that out. There are some things out there. We do that. Thank you. Yeah. Just 
Farming out because there's so many regulations. I have to see a fire box. It's not just a book. Oh, no, it's books. It's an encyclopedia like back in the 80s when you bought the yep. That's a CFR. There are so many regulations in there. It's not worth your time. That is like 60 hours. It just figure out your 60 hours to somebody that already does it. Just farming out ahead of time. And, and we've done it for food, for pharmaceutical, for um, the biotechnics. The process is very similar. The product changes a little bit, but the process is similar and it's it's deep and involved. And what I found in any industry, including pharma, when people when anybody doesn't fully understand the complexity of writing these SOPs and building compliance plans, they underestimate the difficulty and the time. Joanne, I think you said it. the time always add more. <laughs> People underestimate the time and effort it takes to build this this type of work because it's so complex. It looks very easy at the at the, at the high level, but when you get in, you run into things that you don't even know you don't know, and it gets really complicated. So part of the yeah, so part of this whole thing is when you build yourself a quality plan, you're setting yourself up from day one that this is how we're going to operate. We're going to have management review meetings once a month, and we're going to identify problems, and we're going to have ways to prevent future troubles. We're going to have processes in place that can correct these actions. These are all the things you want to do as a business, even if you're not necessarily required to do these things. I recommend it because... Bill, I think you were saying it, the retailers have the right to pick and choose who they want to buy from. And if you cannot prove that you have good certificates of analysis, you have good operating procedures to produce a very consistent product or a consistent crop time after time, people aren't going to be interested. They want, when, when, a, when a customer likes the thing they like, they want it to be the same every time. So you have to build quality, testing, branding, all those things have to work together. So audit plans, who has had an audit? I just want to raise hand. Okay, or well, how many? One, two, three, four, five. Whether it's FDA, ISO, okay. So when you, there's a, an organization out now called Canada Safety and Quality. And they're a third party auditor. They come in and they will check your good agricultural practice, good manufacturing practice. And there's a, it's very prescriptive and they go through multiple phases of what they need to inspect. And I'm actually gonna just give you a quick highlight because I wanna identify something that's really interesting you might not think of. What are all your agricultural inputs? That's one thing they check. They check environmental monitoring. How are you keeping humidity? How are you storing your dried material? Um, allergen management. Do you have that in place? Do you have identification and traceability of the seed all the way to sale? Um, recall program. Who has a recall program here? Okay. Oh, ooh, I like it. Okay. So, has anyone had a recall yet? Please say no. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. So then the other one is this one is a is a highly overlooked a supplier approval program. Has anyone done? Of course. Yeah. And the reason I say that is. Um, especially for manufacturers, if you're buying your 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 plant from a cultivator that does not have a good process in place and their plants are inconsistent, you need to rate your suppliers in a way that you can identify. Oh, no, okay. Um, you need to make sure that you you probably have critical supplies. Let's put it that way. So there's there's a category ranking typically. You've got critical and minor suppliers. What if you lose your critical supplier? What do you do? Do you have backup? Do you have a secondary? Do you have one that is going to be able to fulfill what you need in a timely manner? 
with the same quality. So the, the critical suppliers should be scrutinized a lot. And we should require certain human terminology. And it's okay. You can give them checklists to follow. That's something that has to be focused on. Right? So supplier approval is big. Um, and it's a funny thing in the FDA world, if you don't have good supplier approval programs in place, that is such a common audit finding. <laughs> and if it's common in the big pharma companies, imagine how common it's going to be in other industries. And the other reason I say that is that big pharma has incredible mature controls in place. And cannabis is just starting to do that. So to get ahead as businesses in this industry, if you have those controls in place now, people will trust you a lot more than others that don't have these controls. So I would use these controls to your advantage. In a, in a marketing standpoint, because it's going to put you in a better position with the retailers who say, how do we know this is a good product? And the more you can educate the, the retailers to buy your product, the more following these compliance rules, and we have good testing controls in place, then they'll trust you. And don't be hesitant not to take COAs from them and have them tested before. People buy their free rolls and come from China. Find uh, a nickel. So you take a bunch of pre rolls from them during your supplier evaluation. You just send the papers to us and send it out for the heavy metals just to make sure it passes. Right. So you're keeping them on your feet. And if they know you're doing that, they're going to send the good stuff because each and every single one of these critical compliance people, they have good stuff and they have the stuff that didn't pass that they're going to swap off yeah. with people when they, when they can't. And that's the new world. Oh, they, they try with us. Do it. So be diligent. And keep on it. It's just like your own business. You have to look at the critical suppliers as an extension of you. If, if you don't, it's just like you're running your own business. If you're not there and active and involved, things will slip through the cracks. It's the same with your good with your suppliers. And the better the relationship you have with them, you will be better as a business too. So this, this is really the end. Um, at some point, I don't know when. Cannabis will be actually regulated on a much larger scale, not just under COVID and dietary. But as you're building your companies, think about this. Think about getting, think bigger. Think like, think like a federal regulator because it's going to put you in a better place economically. It really will. It, it, it's kind of a pain, but guess what? It's required. You don't have a choice anymore. You have to follow compliance programs. SOPs, good manufacturing practice, good agricultural practice. It's part of the lifeblood of your business. Just like cash flow, compliance it has to be part of it. And your documentation practice is critical. Make sure you keep it as a living document. You have somebody to control the documentation. It doesn't, doesn't just sit in a book and everybody walks away. It has to be follow and the OCM knows how to find that the auditors know how to see that they'll ask that it's kind of like pulling a thread they'll find one document that they see is most critical and if it's a mess or if they see the process is a mess in one particular area they're going to start asking you for the documents that relate to that that's SOP that relates to the SOP they pulled and they found problems they're going to pull the other related areas of your business that's where they're going to find the problems so that's all I have for today. All right. Okay. Wow. So last, but certainly not the least, I'm really excited to hear from her because when these regulations came out with CPIs all over them, it made my head spin. <laughs> and uh, Elise is on the policy committee at Penny which is the committee that does a lot of the legwork of aggregating all of the comments from all of the committees, uh, putting them into a, into a good form. And yeah, yeah, that, so just yeah. zeros. Uh, during the public form. comment phase. Uh, she's on the front lines. She's also a general counsel at MJI Solutions, and she has agreed to help us unpack TPIs. Okay, so thank you. Because it's a lot of question and answer. Hey everybody. Hi. Um, so I actually 
stole this presentation from Axel Burnaby from a New York State Bar Association event, because um, obviously OCM is the one who can talk about it best, right? Um, how many of you guys know about TP? Uh, let's let's pull the room here. How many of you are existing licensees? Okay, good amount. How many of you are looking to enter into the cultivation space? Okay, how many in the processing? Uh, what about dispensary? Okay. All right. What what about shout it out? What is that? What are, what's everyone else doing that didn't raise their hand? Is it processing? Processing. Okay. All right. So, as you guys kind of know, right? You can't be vertically integrated in New York. So what does that mean when we talk about vertical integration? We're talking about being able to do all the phases of from cultivation to dispensing or delivery. So you can't hold a cultivation processing distribution license and then also dispense or deliver have on site. What a lot of people don't understand is not only is there a prohibition on vertical integration, but there's a lot of prohibitions on the horizontal integration. So let's talk about what that means. When we say, just like I said, prohibition. So you can't have all four of these things. You're only authorized to either stay in a supply tier category. So when we talk about supply tier, we're talking about cultivators, processors, distributors. When we talk about retailers, uh, we're looking at retailing, on-site delivery. And then obviously we got this own little category of lab testing. So for example, good old Biotrex over here can't be invested or participating in anybody else's uh, cultivation, processing, distribution, dispensary. That includes remediation. Sorry? That includes remediation. It includes ownership, it includes decision-making. So for example, um, you can obviously, if you tell them that they need to remediate their product, you're obviously, of course, able to do so. But if, for example, you decide that you want to have a 10% interest in uh, Nee's dispensary business, you're in trouble. So this is the tiered solution, guys. This is what we're talking about. These are the categories. So you're broken up. They're going to call you a supplier. They're going to call you a retailer. They're going to call you a lab. They're going to call you a RO with dispensing opportunities. So any registered organizations, either employees or participants, all right, cool. We'll just X that category out of them. Um, really, what we want to focus on here is understanding if you guys are getting going or currently you're an AUCC and you're going to transfer over into the general license, but you're running out of money and got to add new business partners. What does this mean, right? What does it mean if you're going for a dispensary license, but your investors are invested in cannabis outside of New York State in a supply tier? There's a lot of issues that come with it. So no person may have direct or indirect interests across all tiers with even stock ownership, okay? Um, next is gonna be this horizontal. So basically this is what the MRTA says. MRTA was passed in 2021. Person holding an adult use cultivator license cannot hold a dispensary license. No cultivator shall have direct or indirect interest in either stock ownership, interlocking directors, mortgage lien, personal real property, management agreements. So guys, here's the, the very interesting component of this. We're not just talking about money, okay? We're not just talking about equity interest. We're talking about a lab having decision-making processes in your cultivation site. We're talking about having a store have a direct partnership agreement to supply products from your cultivation site. Anytime, even if there's not monetary involvement, you still have possible TPI activation. So TPIs can be activated even by people with managing directors. So what do I mean by that? So say, for example, I'm general counsel at MJI Solutions. I'm their lawyer. I'm in the leadership role. I have, I'm sitting at the table with ownership and we're making decisions every Every single day. Now, I'm on the supply team. If, for example, me or a spouse want to have interest in a dispensary, I'm not allowed to do that. So, um, so no person may have direct, indirect financial or controlling interest in more than one adult use cultivation license. 
If you're in an AUCC right now, or your investors have multiple interests in other AUCCs because they've been permitted to do so under the AUCC, but now want to move into the general, keep you and keep the three guys that they already have, you're in big trouble. Not going to be allowed to do it. That's what we're talking about, horizontal, lim or horizontal limitations, okay? TPI, true party interest. What does it mean? I kind of briefly went over this. TPI framework captures every direct or indirect interest in a license. People with controlling interest, 51% we're talking about here, right? The farmers right now, the processors, the uh, communities with a disproportionate impact have had a conviction and business experience, but 51%, those are people we consider with controlling interest. But there's a lot of other ways that people can get controlling interest in your business. And a lot of it's done at base level with operating agreements, with how the way your corporation is formed, who are your board of directors, who have votes in all of your decision-making processes. A lot of ways people are going to try to control your business, and it's going to be through ways that may not necessarily be monetary. Who has a share of ownership? Stockholders, uh, people with future rights to ownership. So children of people... Uh, who you have big investors with, say they they have future right ownership to your business. Those people may activate TPI. Passive investors, anybody who makes up the ownership structure at each level in a license. And guys, I have 25 minutes. It's a very complicated topic. Ask the question during because it can get lost. So if you guys are like, this is going right over my head, just be like, slow down, chill out. Let's back it up. Um, yeah, you guys can have it. I'll uh, Joanne can shoot it over to you. Um, so people with financial interest in the business, this is going to be a really interesting one. I'm going to I'm going to touch it at the end. And, and guys, caveat: we're getting revised regs on May 11th the next OCM meeting, we're going to change up a lot of this language. So take it all with a grain of salt. A lot of this, I'll say this, it's not going to be more limiting. It's only going to be allowing a little bit more either monetary allotment or expansion, I'll say. Okay. But for now, we'll look at this as kind of the strictest interpretation. So a goods and services provider. We'll do some examples of goods and services providers, but those are things like construction, architecture, accountants, lawyers, people who you prop compliance teams, people you contracted out to help you, their goods and service provider. Even those people, if they pass a certain threshold, are going to activate TPI. So this is kind of an example of multi-level ownership, okay? Every single person on here activates TPI. And that's because the only one that didn't have shareholder or some sort of equity interest is the spouse of the CEO. And even they have TPI because if you're the spouse of somebody with interest in your company, they're, on, they're getting listed on your form. So obviously you have these vertical restrictions, right? But what most people aren't understanding is passive investors. So when we talk about a passive investor, passive investors don't have decision-making capabilities. They're not sitting there and going, hey, this is how you're going to run your business. You're going to do an X, Y, and Z. And uh, I want my money return at X point. Usually passive investors are just giving monetary aggregative ownership. So it's typically you're not hitting passive investor unless you're at 5% or 20% of a publicly traded or privately held applicant. But most importantly, they don't have control or influence. Now, this language might get changed because passive investors can get very confusing, okay? So now we're talking about these people being TPIs, but they're, they're passive investors because you could be both. And it gets a little convoluted. And OCM's been alerted to that because a lot of people are passive investors right now in AUCCs and AUCPs that don't intend to be TPIs in general. So keep your eye out. If you have passive investors in your company, it's very complicated. Yeah, go ahead. Opportunities for That's a good question. So crowdfunding is going to be very interesting. Um, you know, Jason Klimek and I were just talking about this. Jason ran policy as well. Crowdfunding is tough because typically under these rules, crowdfunding can act with everybody in the TPI who's crowdfunded right now. But then there's all these other exceptions, right? So like people are allowed gifts up to 17K right now. 
If you were just a handsome buddy over at check for 17K, it's considered a gift. He did that 25 times and independent of a crowdfunding, crowdsource funding or whatever. I mean, you could probably circumvent it, but it's a lot of, that's where this is a situation where you absolutely should engage an attorney because any type of money that you're bringing in on your business, you should be vetting. And every time you bring a TPI, a passive investor, a partner, anytime you're talking to anybody, you want to include the business decision-making capabilities. Vet the absolute crap out of them, okay? You just have no other choice but to be doing background checks. You have to make sure that you know every single interest they're involved in because if you find out that your TPIs have violated the, the laws here, your license is at risk. It's yours that they're going to take away. And you're either going to have to decide that, you know, we're going to remove them as a TPI because they're, they're creating a problem here. So we have to divest them or you're going to run out of money and then you have to get rid of your license because you didn't think it through and now you're in the hole. So this is what I'm talking about when I say horizontal restrictions, okay? Horizontal restrictions, meaning I'm in the supply tier. I know I can't have a dispensary, but what else can't I have? Well, if I'm a cultivator, I can only have one cultivation license. If I'm a dispensary, I can have three licenses. And mind you, it's not three locations per license. You're allowed three licenses. So some of these card license holders, right, may do one license with the group they're on, but in the general, they might go a totally separate way and have another different type of license. So it doesn't have to be same group or anything like that. You can be in different categories. Delivery, you can have one license. On-site consumption, you can have three. RODs or RONDs, you can have one. Micro, you can have one. Co-op, you can have one. Now, some of these things are subject to change. As you notice, processing isn't on here, right? Processing right now, you can have as many licenses as you want. That's the language at the moment. It's bonkers. And the reason that I think personally why there's no cap on processing is because they're forcing white labeling brand and licensing agreements to grab processor licenses. That's very unique. They do not do that in other states. They don't require you to get processing licenses, plant touching licenses when you're doing brand deals. Now they got to get those licenses. So when you're sitting there going, oh, I'm going to go grow for cookies. Cookies needs to have probably a processing brand name license now that typically they wouldn't have had previously. Um, so we're going to see a lot of those, but now you know, now you know, they can have 15 of those and they wouldn't activate TPI. How, how do having brand names not, I guess, violate the brand agreement and violate the party interest? So if you have a processing license and they have a processing license and you engage in that respect, okay, and you both are processors of brand name only, you can have as many processing licenses as you want and not activate TPI because you're not crossing into the cultivation or, or anything else that would violate TPI. Does that make sense? So you having, uh, so if there's an AUCC and they also co-own an AUCC, they're considered separate. So like, so say you're an A, all right, good example. Say you're an AUCC, you also have an AUCP license, and then you're switching over now because maybe you're, you're switching into the general and you still want a cultivation and a processing license. You could go grab processing brand license, a processing uh, infusion license, a processing extraction license, and then engage your processing brand license or any of your processing licenses with another brand licensing agreement. You just sell to each other. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's... It's confusing, but that, yeah. It seems like there have been a couple of brands coming out on um, smoke right now. Yep. Um, brand processing in relation to out of state brands that are coming into the marketplace and um, using the processing license to now launch their product in market. Mm -hmm. uh, how does that work? So, AUCCs, AUCPs are having kind of their own little, you guys are having your own time right now. Okay? It's, it's, you haven't really had many inspections. You're kind of getting a very hands-off approach with OCM. And some of the things that are happening in the AUCP times are not going to transfer over unless you're getting extremely limited in the general, okay? So for example, say, uh, I'm going to keep using cookies as an example. Cookies has a, a contract with a processor in New York State. They're getting their brand in the New York State. They probably have joint ownership or some type of structure where cookies is getting either equity or profit sharing or what have you with that processing company. 
that that's going to go through their two years with the AUCP license unless something changes. But once you get into the general, they most likely will get their own license and then start contracting out with a bunch of different brands. Gotcha. So here's where it gets kind of tricky. Okay. Undue influence. Undue influence came about when the car licenses were dropped. Okay. And I feel bad for people who are doing the card licenses because a lot of the things changed after you had already applied. Big problem, right? So people who applied for card licenses or really anybody who's applying for dispensary licenses, you have to be incredibly careful because right now, if you are a dispensary and you have any TPIs that have interest in any supply tier, any in the world, okay? If any one of your uh, investors is invested even in a small capacity in a grow operation, a processing operation, distribution, or micro business license, anywhere in the supply tier, that's gonna be a problem. You're gonna get a rejection on your license if they find out that your TPIs have interest other places. The reason for that, because office cannabis management is paranoid, very scared that you're going to grow in another state and sell to your dispensary in New York. It's the number one thing. They do when interstate commerce inevitably comes up, which we don't know how long that'll be. They don't want out-of-state product in New York stores. I think it's a little unrealistic that out-of-state product won't be in New York stores, you know, just in general in some type of capacity. But undue influence is making it very difficult for dispensaries to find financial backers, right? I mean, imagine people who want to fund cannabis or people who've already been in cannabis. They're not just coming out of the woodwork going, oh, hey, you know, let me take a bet on this one guy in New York State. I mean, some might be, but most people with large months capital have been in cannabis for quite a bit of time. And those are people that most likely are not going to be part of dispensaries. Okay, goods and services providers. This is technically a non-TPI unless they violate. So this is a, there's three types of people who can be a, a goods and service provider. It's either exempt, non-exempt, or management service. An exempt agreement, okay, somebody who doesn't have the ability to control or influence decisions. Their compensation might be a flat fee and it can cross tiers. So for example, let's use Michelle as an example. Michelle is technically an exempt provider. She's doing compliance on the cultivation side. She can do compliance on the processing side, on the, on the dispensing side. But if Michelle, let's see, goes above this 10%, 50%, 100K rule. At the moment, I think they're getting raised. I think it's gonna be 250. Don't go me, but wait till May 11th. If this rule applies as it is today, Michelle, for a pre-licensed business, okay? So pre-licensed, use, let's use me as an example, MJI Solutions. I wanna be ready to go once I get a license. So I'm gonna pay Michelle 900, you know, $99,000 in this one year to get all my SOPs done, to get all of my audits going and everything else that I need to get started so that once I get the license, I'm ready to kick off. If I go to 101K in that year, Michelle is now a TPI in my license. Crazy, really crazy because construction is on this. And as you know, construction ends up being a lot more than 100K if you're doing things. Yep. Yeah, we're talking about. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Anybody who's in business for more than three years, did you make a profit in the first three years? No, absolutely not. Yeah, no, but... no. So, um, yeah, we're talking about consulting, advisory, strategy services, you know, all these types, even, okay, this is what we're talking about. Accounting. So when I talk about the 10, 50, 100 rule, the 10% of gross or 50% of net, that's another part of this. You're not going to have that, just like bio tracks that are, you're not going to have that until you start making money. You can't have 10 or 50% of revenue when there is no revenue. So the 100 rule is what applies until you start seeing something on your balance sheet, right? But 100K is not a lot. Of, I mean, it is a lot of money. I don't want to be disrespectful. It is a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money when we're talking about getting a business going and we're talking about having certain services. Like for those people who are doing bigger scale construction operations on an indoor grow, think about an indoor grow where you're doing more than 6,000 square feet. You're getting above 100,000 in about one second. 
right? I mean, it just doesn't make any fiscal sense. Uh, mind you, Kiani has done a lot to say that this is bonkers to the OCM. So just know we're in the year. Um, some non-exempt people. So here's where non-exempt is gonna get you out of play very fast. So if you're a non-exempt operator, so if you're a provider that has the ability to influence decision, if you're a provider that is making your key business decisions, so big one here, management service agreements, okay? A lot of AUCCs have purchased a management service agreement, and then that person has been growing for three other farms under their SOPs, under their you know, direction, not allowed in the general. Not allowed. MSAs immediately trigger TPI. So unless you want that one person to be your TPI. It's not a business right now. It's not going to be if you're part with somebody who's in an MSA, it's not going to be a business that works out in New York State. Um, I kind of talked about this. So a management service agreement is usually a provider given the ability to directly influence the licensee's decisions regarding cannabis or their product. It's usually a flat fee. Um, and that's usually like we're talking about people who come in, and a lot of people from out of state do this, right? They come in, they go, hey, you guys are not going to grow. Let me give you everything you need to be able to grow. We have a charge of fact, maybe we'll take a little bit of your profit. But we're going to do this with 700 people. Not a lot. Um, so when a person has multiple goods and services agreements with the licensee, again, if I... Um, contract my accountant and you know I only use them for like one scope of service and it was 50k they're setting everything up they're doing all my taxes whatever and then in that year I do another scope of service with them and it's 60k that one year I've done now 110 with them PPI I have a question the next, uh... slide sure um... Oh, sorry. Yep. Uh, MSAs? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, is there a difference between consulting and training? Provider? Give me examples. Coming in as, as a consultant versus a trainer, and I was told, uh, can be classified differently in terms of how you uh, are and things like that. Okay. So, like, basically, you're saying you come in, you're going to maybe do employee handbook training, or maybe you're going to do training on like proper standard operating procedures, maybe ways to do lab testing or what have you. But you have no decision making ability in their business. You're really just a hired service to kind of come in at the moment, keep your bill. Their services are pretty similar in terms of the acceptance and capability. I guess it's probably the line of the same capability. I got to be honest with you, you probably should consult a lawyer on that because if you're getting a little too close, you're going to. You'd want to be careful, and if your name keeps popping up, they might look at you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, if you've been investors, and when you vet them, they're clean, but then without you knowing, they can invest in somebody else. If that can affect you at that point, would you be fine? Or would so you could basically keep vetting your investors constantly? Constantly, your investor gets a DUI; they have to tell you, and you have to report it to the OCM. And it's not a and it's not a long turnaround; it's like four days. Yeah, three days. Yeah, it's something ridiculous. Bonkers, actually. Um, I mean, like, it, it sounds, it sounds like we are being boosted to get the boost our investment. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. And with so many hats, mm -hmm. everyone in here cares. Do you really have time to do that? Oh, it's it's so unrealistic. What? They're not have the time to do it. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, they're just, the issue here is we're, we've taken alcohol and we've times it by three, okay? It was in the beginning, the premise was to take an alcohol-based approach to this, was to look at Washington State, have that type of approach, and make sure that there wasn't big business coming in and dominating spaces. But the issue is here, and we've voiced this many, many times, is yeah, you can bonk big business, but don't curb small business now. And small business is having to have difficulty with financial raises. It's having difficulty. If I have to take 10 investors, knowing that Tom is gonna go, you know, have a couple and get pulled over and doesn't tell me for three months. And then I have to go and make sure that doesn't violate my TPI now. It's like a lot of erroneous re requirements for somebody who's just like, I'm trying to grow some weed. Like, let me live. Right. 
So, um, that's why we'll need like client managers eventually, right? So, this somebody who has to actually be staying on all those hearings. So, I have a question. What if sure. they gave me money, but I don't know where that money came from? As in, like, there's such a path to the investor, they were like, so you have to list out your passive investors. You have to list out your passive investors. Like, oh, no. like this money was just there. It was just, it was like, wow, there was this double bag full of like, well, all the some of that money came from. I love it, but ignorance isn't an excuse. I've been in the best things really well, guys. I've been on a board and then all of a sudden there was a park. <laughs> right place, right time. Is that a seventeen thousand dollars? If it's if it's the if it hits the seventeen threshold, there you know you don't have to report that. Yeah. Well, what if what if it's more than that? Like if it's more than that, you got to report. Yeah, yeah you got to report. If you're depo are you depositing in a bank account? No, I just have money in a duffel bag. Yeah, I don't know. I don't want to do this. <laughs> Like that's pretty much it. What do I say to them then? I say call Jason Clinic at Barclay Dame and see what he has to say. <laughs> um, other people have any questions? I know this is a, this is kind of a crazy topic. It's but it's really important, guys. And it's one of those things where I don't think a lot of people are really understanding it until you're gonna be in the throes of it and you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, I've already committed and I've seen this with AUCCs, okay? AUCC guys who have taken money. And now the issue is those guys have also violated TPI or potential TPI issues that's going to happen in the general. And, you know, especially because a lot of you guys are already out AUCCs and ACPs, be very mindful, do your due diligence right now before you guys apply. And so when you guys apply, your the application for, for any of your licensing is actually very limited, okay? App, applying for general only requires you to show TPIs, pass investors, your financial records, you have to have an energy report and you're going to have to have a social equity impact report. Okay. Very limited things you have. You don't even need real estate, very limited things that you need to apply. Now, once you get approval on that application, you're going to have 12 months to finish out your provisional license. Your provisional license is when a lot of these things come into play. Things like compliance, SOPs, your CGMP, CGAP, all of those things. So, um, you know, just be aware that things you can do right now, if you guys are planning to get into the space, things you can do right now, vest out your money, vest out your investors, make sure you understand where they what they have their money coming from, if they have any other interests, and ask yourself if you want to be in business with this person, can you trust them enough for them to tell you things and, and be part, you know, responsible of your, your company. Got a couple more minutes, so otherwise we're probably going to get, yeah. So let's say you met somebody, they were fine before, they decided to invest something else, now you kind of have a problem, what do you do? You have to report to the OCM immediately, and you have to figure out whether they have violated CPI, whether you have to divest their tax, or if they want to divest their other interests. You have to have the combo. And you're given a time to pay the no, yeah. I mean, but you're going to be audited on that now. They're going to make sure that that guy is, or girl is... Or they are about this out. Mm -hmm. I just listed uh, like five things that will lead to the application. They yeah. Did not seem, you know, robust is what I would consider. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So it's really financials, and financials has a bunch of different parts to it, right? Understanding your bank accounts, your investors, your passive investors, anybody who's activating TPIs. I would list out your goods and services providers that you're intending to do, use or are currently using. Energy report. Now, energy report is going to be a little different for like a retail dispensary. I'll get to you in one second. Energy report is going to be a little different for a retail dispensary than for, say, like a cultivation site. If I'm doing an indoor grow, you guys read up on the energy regs because you've got a lot of requirements that I don't think people are really thinking about. One being geothermal uh, bonkers. I don't know. I mean, just absolute craziness. I've said bonkers like six times because a lot of it just goes through one ear and out the other. But um, and then a community impact plan, social equity plan. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so, my dad, this is a lot. Of course, yeah. So, if you just, if you were trying to do um, the crowd, if, I would say we had a conversation over here about blocking. Yep. So, do it. So when you're cooperative, you're going to be under that supply tier. 
because there is a cooperative license, <clears throat> co-op license, but that has its own limitations and restrictions that license has its own component to it. So my question though, with investments, right? Yep. Is there any way that um, they can sign, sign a waiver? Sure. Like, you know, I will inform you if. Yep. Blah, 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 that kind of, you know, help mitigate your risk? Well, it's not going to mitigate your risk, but like, say, for example, they violate it, then you have cause to get removed them, right? So you engage with them and you say, hey, everybody's got to sign. Well, most likely they're going to sign some sort of uh, operating agreement or some sort of component of like your structure for your company. And on top of that, you can also have waivers and things like that, but they're going to have reporting requirements. These guys... So it's, it's important for that to be a very transparent conversation right out of the gate that if you're participating in this, we're all on the line. It's a, it's a hand-holding endeavor here. If, if somebody screws up, you're going to put everybody else at risk. Um, and so I, I really can only encourage incredible transparency because, you know, in the event that somebody screws you on your license, like you're going to be subjected to the OCM having to decide on whether or not that's your fault and you're going to get your license revoked. But, if you have that, it's like, like, but you're going to have reporting requirements. So right. even okay. though you have that waiver in place, what they're going to tell you is fine, get rid of the guy, but you're going to have to do that in the next X amount of months. And you can yeah. put a ask for, for forfeiture in there, quads, if not your legal thing about that. You know, if they do do that and okay, you now are kicked out and whatever assets you put in with us are now in our, you know, that kind of. Yeah, so like, for example, that's a good point. We were talking about, let's say it's money. Say you violate that and it's part of your agreement. You say, hey, we're going to take all the money. Then invest. you don't get it back because you screwed us. Yeah. Yep. Sure. I'm looking for for any kind of conversation about generation. Yep. Cogen sites, yeah. We have two power cogens for us across the street, so I'm pretty familiar, yeah. Yeah, so I'm trying to, yeah, because yeah, I understand trying to get the fossil fuels. Yep. But it kind of makes sense. Right? If we can 30% of your electricity taking off the grid, yep. the reason I handle what's going to come on to in, in your uh, corporation. Yep. Gonna I think cogens are going to, they have to be explained though. I think cogens will, but you got the cogens is going to probably run on fossil fuels, but it is going to save you on electric. So it's like, what are you bartering? You know? And it's like, do you care more about the going off the grid? It kind of sounds like they want you on the grid. That's the issue is like the way they've written the regs, it's like they want you on the grid or some supplemented solar or, or wind. Oh, absolutely. Good. We're going to have the first blackout in probably 20 days. I mean, it's <laughs> crazy. I want to thank you. Yes. Panelists, for anyone who can say and wants to get more into the QA, I do want to let you know that um, the Cultivation Committee has, I personally have been having dialogue with the OCM. We have a prevented communication channel. We've asked for a town hall event. We, we ask that they, they schedule it with us and be present. They came back with a lot of, uh, let's say, um, I don't know, not, not happy, <laughs> sort of defensive response. And so we're going to the cultivation committee to schedule this town hall event be sometime between when the next regs drop and before the June first deadline of when these changes are that we're trying to, um, you know, we're trying to put them as well. And then I believe we'll we'll be doing some So I want all of you guys to stay plugged into that because we're going to ask you not only to bring presence. Uh, we did a cultivation survey. So we're going to be addressing the top concerns of what we've heard back from our community. But we're also going to ask you to invite your representatives, you know, and, and whether the OCM shows up or not, we'll let them know when it's happening. We'll let them know who's going to be attending. I know that my local representatives will be there. So the more the merrier for sure. And we've been pushing and pushing and pushing until we get to meet. So on that note, I would like to invite back the folks who presented this afternoon. And let's just take a few questions if you have to leave. I know we were meant to end at four. So feel free. Um, and thank you all for being here today. I appreciate that. We'll be sending out a survey as well through Eventbrite to get your feedback. We'd love to hear that so we can improve the next. Any questions for our folks here tonight, today? Yes, ma'am. Bill, can you explain the difference between uh, <laughs> there's a lot of cultivators that you know I know the answer. The difference uh, between the line testing and the batch testing and how that relates to that's where you retail it. And then yeah. Hey guys. Oh boy. Um <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I, I kind of touched on that, though, 
Um, it's weird in the sense. So batch testing, the way you use that terminology, actually is more of an R&D process. So cultivator X has biomass left, wants to sell it to processor X. Processor X won't buy it or bring it to the facility without certain testing. So that's what that is. Lime testing is odd in the sense of the dispensary because it does it dispensary, and I think this is going to play into it. Some processors are already aware of this. Line testing allows you to basically take a, a bunch of items of similar quality, like I, I mentioned, 10 milligram gummies, yeah. put that all together in one spot, and then test them. But the problem there is, in one of the fears is, is that those results are being diluted by the other. So let's say one of the five of those gummies is a problem. The problem is then is that now you get that and you have a CPR COA that now has all five lines lot numbers on it and how do you relate that back now there's other issues to this too this is where the line testing could have been done to help processes and cultivators better with being able to get the correct values that they need because also when you do that and checking in potency for instance right this is one of the reasons why the line testing of flower got shut down they were able to put potency values based off of seeds potential well that's not right right because every single person when it comes to um growing and we had people talking about growing earlier today you know the environment you grow in the how you grow in whether you're indoor outdoor all these things come into play that seed person put that potential based on what they grew and they know that strain well and they've developed it in their space forever right um so that was the problem there but again even in that space is, is let's say Let's say your team at one time didn't or handle the product with out gloves on one strain, but then you bring those things together and they don't individually with gloves. Now you're diluting out those results. So it's tricky in that regard. Now there are ways around that if the process was bought out more, but it can affect anybody. And even as a retailer, though, when you're looking at branding and everything else, the brands you bring in are your uh, bread and butter, really. So, you know, looking at those results on your end are going to matter. And the truth of the matter is, is when it comes to line testing, until the program is flushed <laughs> out or even within it, I'm not personally sure I would utilize the brand. I just want to let everyone know if Elise had a piece out, she said. So, <laughs> My email address is here. It's cultivation at If you have any questions for her, you will receive um, an email with the presentations, everybody who did register. And if you have any further questions or need to reach anybody that was on the panel and you can't somehow or some way reach out to me and I'll, I'll connect you. Questions? For compliance, we use best management practices. Do they have to be specific? They have to be specific. They have to be specific. They have to be in our regulations. I mean, you use it for the practices of internally from an operational standpoint for your own structure, like a ticket management meeting. I don't know. But as far as the brand application, it's very specific. Go ahead. Uh, for processors, they have to have all that. Do you think it's like you're going to use their performance by being required to have a CGP plus um, vivification? Uh, I think you're you're going to start with CGMP as a foundation. You may have to go that way. I would prepare. This is how I would operate typically. Prepare for the worst case scenario. Do you like the I'm going to ask you about the VRC. Yeah. So if you have that as your goal, PMP is the baby. Yes. So and if you have time. VRC up there, you're more out of you're going to go. Yeah, without the acronyms for the people who don't know what you just said, like what you just said. Oh, S S Q up the state building foods. It's an auditing uh, body for anybody that makes a food production. That's your beverages and your edibles and candies and everything else. B R C is the British Food Authority. Same, similar body, and it, it's you know, sections one through eight. They go every single line, going from it goes from management all the way to food safety, compliance, regulatory. Thank you. Like, 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 yeah, if you go to the VRC website or SQL website, they'll give you what their section is. I think they're on version of eight already. Maybe even nine. Anyone else? Yeah. Michelle, are you with a medical group that does the cannabis stuff around New York State? I saw that on Luminous, similar to I'm a friend of LP, does medical stuff. No, great. Right. Right. We're separate. separate. The molecule, right. we work in part line. 
life sciences and campus. How long have you been in the life science industry of campus? Uh, the last two and a half years. And what did you farm on for over 20? Farm on for that. Yeah. Thank you. I might have missed what you said when you uh, started. That's but... great. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Nelly. Um, so Michelle, what was the name of the third party audit company that you mentioned? Oh, Cannabis uh, CQS, Cannabis Quality uh, Safety. Um, there are also, if you go on to the OCM website, you can see the, the authors that are approved and accredited because they're kind of beautiful. And that's what Peter would know more about right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have a question for Bill. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that terpenes are not required for state testing. I I might have that on March first they were. So when it gets that part, it's only like if it's actually on a label. So if you make it a package plan, then it is required. Yeah, I think that's all. Isn't that also if you're going if you're going to market it by the terpenes that needs to be on the packaging, but for right. test for it, I think it's the so the chart where it's it's marked. That's not that there's an amendment. Yeah, it's correct. So the testing limits, if you go through those, there's several actually aspects that they haven't changed. So the reason why they haven't fully changed those, and what most people don't know is they just did they went from emergency regs to actual to the actual lab regs. However, if, if you look at them, they have really almost no changes to the to the reg itself. Right. And with that, though, we know that there's another set coming down the line that's going to go along with that. There's other aspects of that. For instance, I have two technicians in the lab that have been working there for seven, eight, ten years or something like that. We can't actually listen to the technicians. They can't touch cannabis product in a lab, all because of the degree level, even though they have a decade of experience and stuff. So there, there's an aspect to that. Now, I've asked that specific question, and I know we've had a phone conversation about that too, you brought it up. I've asked that specifically to OCM. It is not required, just as much as residual salt is not required on flowers. If you read the test limits right now, it actually says all finished cannabis products. Right? So I've had to get email specifically from the deputy director that says that that's not required. Because again, any analyte that they add to it, that's an extra piece, extra price that we don't want to have to push to the customer or eventually the consumer in that regard. So yeah, there is that aspect. I submitted with our team, I don't know, probably 20 plus flower protocols since then, for flower plant samples since then. Not a single one's come back, not a single one's set true. Yeah, basically what it is, the OCM is for safety and quality. If you're making a label for your own head, so this had L limonene in it and it had to be you have to have a certainty done to prove your label. Just like if you know General Mills puts food free on the period, right? Guess who had to do the testing for them? We have because they said it was on the label. So if you make a label claim, it becomes a regular thing. Terpenes are it's that. not a safety, it's not a safety issue. Terpenes is not a safety issue if you don't make a label claim, it's all of the person. Remember that the other issue of legal claim. If you make a label claim that's not within work authorization for the business that you use, that's why if it's if it falls in the healthcare branch, you have to eat them separately. They they've actually given um hemp or hemp producers and hemp businesses warning about it. Because they need health claims that are just approved. Yeah, one person did hemp starts and then put down the ego friendly. Dumb. It's labeling is critical. It's a label. They just had it vetted by somebody and she does that all the time. They look and go, well, we need your documentation and data. So this is, you know, that you got to make sure this or see this or whatever. What if you have on your website? Why don't you label them and direct people to your website on your left website? Awesome. The website is labeled. Website, sell sheets. Okay. Instructions for use, not that you really need them, but you might. Um, you might for new, for new people coming in to see three shows. That's that is a regulated label. Yeah, so I'm sorry to say that should be not a requirement for instruction of use, but it is listed in the guidance. I missed the first part of what you said. So you said it's not required to put clear usage instructions, but I think that's in the, in the requirements. They have to do that. Um, clear use 
instructions for use yeah. is part of your product legally. That's what you're saying. So once you have an instruction for use something, right. that is official labeling that now becomes regulated on your OCM and it's a regulatory parameter in the business. Right. And all of the rules for each label, whether it's website, <coughs> for use, um, cell sheets, creation material, all of those have to be compliant with the regulations for each of those label items. They all have to be in effect. Once you start gonna... it, you can't stop it. Right. And you need to revise every iteration of that label so you have a review. Hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, for those of us that want to get more involved with the cannabis status in New York and then in the New York has to use like this, what sort of thing do they have to know? Join Canny. <laughs> Join Farm Bureau. There's all groups that represent the, the market right now, the industry right now. So Candy, Annie is an umbrella. They represent the whole industry, right? And they're in the state, right? Is that correct? So yeah, it's the whole supply whole chain. And then Farm Bureau represents the farmers mostly, so the cultivators, but then also, um, you know, they're part of the association cultivating and farming. So Farm Bureau is the largest group that represents the farming industry in New York State, that by the largest farmer who represents, you know, farmers in America, American farmers. Both groups together are right now the current being the policy right now, the groups that are pushing for lobbying. Like right now, we put all the table and we're going to try to come together to figure out where you're going to be from your opinion. And then independent cultivators, you know, we met earlier, yeah. Mike's an AUCC thrower, there's another one over here. There was about seven or eight AUCC cultivators in the room today with everybody. So currently licensed growers and then processors and testers. So there's lots of these new events. And I talked to us and say, how are you doing this stuff? Well, thank you. Hey, we got five questions. You know, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wait, just five questions. Five. <laughs> 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 Remind me your name in the back. Yeah. So, cultivators are looking for interesting people in the industry, right? That can help with cultivation business. I have a good person who has a lot of experience from the state of Kentucky. If you're interested in meeting your Peter. I, I recommend you connect with here. Yeah, we met earlier today. Any of you that needs to know more because he's got a lot of knowledge of this state thing. So, and so, yes, and also reach out here and I can connect you with Farm Bureau. I can connect you with Candy and all that kind of stuff. At the end of the day, I feel like there's there's power in numbers yeah. and there's been so much, you know, Elise left, but she's on that policy committee and I see what they do. I mean, they just aggregate all of the committees you know, work and, and opinions and thoughts. And then they they put it, I mean, if anyone who's a member of county, you would have seen all of the uh, public comments that went to the state that county aggregated. So if you want to impact in that way, it's a great way to get involved and all of the committees could use help, you know? And also we're very, there's an education committee, so we're always doing things like this. I'm going to call it a day, um, you know. Okay, one quick, 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 quick last question. Um, actually, not quick, but quick. I mean, yes, quick, but not a question. So, oh. I belong to um, Black Farmers United, uh, New York State, and um, you know, can't help but notice that you know, um, very few of us in the room. Um, and so I just wanted to put a plug out for you know, I think you know that um, Black Farmers United were heavily impacted um, in. It was illegal and now they're making it legal. Um, definitely meeting the experience of being able to come in, learn how to grow, even come up through the industry, and not just as workers, but even the owners, investors. So just one of the it was it, the work, workforce development at one point did have grants available. The workforce, yeah, the WDI has grants and they. So they're getting ready for their next grant season. Farmers have already applied. Some received. Um, work with, uh, yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of opportunity, and I, like I said, I can hook you up and to all of the speakers and what the opportunities are. The WDI has a lot, you know, grant monies and different opportunities. Um, I want to thank you guys. I want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank Tammy for our, for being a part of this both cultivation and the West New York um, committee.
I would love to thank all of our presenters for each and every one of whom were phenomenal. And of course, our gracious hosts here at Buffalo State University. If, if you haven't gotten to really walk around that building where we had lunch, it's truly a splendor and there's just so much going on here. And I'm so grateful for you guys. And I wish you the best of luck in developing this, uh, this business. And I think there's many of us who want to be a part of that. So thank you, thank you, thank you. 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 Thank you.